Hi there and welcome to a new episode of Impact Talks. Today we have a very exciting guest with us, Dan Harden, founder and CEO and principal designer of Whipsaw Agency, a Silicon Valley product design agency. I'm really excited to have you on, Dan. Tell us a little bit about you and what you do. Well, first of all, it's great to be here. Um, it's a beautiful day here in California. Um, and I'm excited to talk about all things design or anything else you'd like to talk about. So I'm an industrial designer. Um, industrial designers create, invent, create, define, document, just products for everyone. Uh, these could be consumer electronics, they could be uh, medical products, industrial goods, furniture, I mean, you name it, we design it. Um, clients typically come to us, different com kinds of companies, startups, large companies, they come to us with a particular set of problems. And sometimes these problems are uh, something like help us productize a new technology or build our brand awareness. They usually come to us with a set of issues. And our team then, through a very back and forth collaborative process, we solve these kinds of problems and ship products to the market. And we've done this for companies like Google and Samsung and uh, just literally 400 other clients. Um, we uh, love what we do. It's just, uh, it's a rush being a designer. It's um, every day is different, it's unique. Um, and I, I've been doing this for several decades and still feels like it's my first day at work every day I go to work. Um, I'm super excited to do what I do. I think yeah, we'll talk about we'll we'll talk about what we do and how we do it and kind of the why behind it. I think that's the most interesting thing about design and what I do. Yeah, I think what the most exciting thing for me um, when I started doing my research on you, and I think the viewers will definitely um, resonate with that, is uh, that you are kind of um, well, at least me speaking from the Netherlands, you're kind of like a secret weapon. When I see. Uh, a lot of these uh, awards that you've been winning, two, 200 plus awards and all these accolades and patents that you have, like we're not talking about a small design agency. We're talking about you're pretty much inventing the next wave of technology and you're on the front lines of seeing what can happen next. And then you're, uh, I mean, you mentioned a couple of companies, but like you said, 400, it's, it's almost unfathomable until you actually go on your website and then I started realizing, I mean, you created products for Uber that we see every day, um, the Google Chromecast, all these products that I walk into the store and I always think that's a nice design. But then I figure out now that most of these designs that I like when I walk into a store, they've been designed by you guys. So <laughs> that is really interesting. And my question to that is, before we start with the background and everything, um, I would love to know why you do it. So why is design such a thing? It's, it wasn't a thing 50 years ago, I can imagine. I mean, most of the things I saw were quite ugly. When I, when I read the biography of Steve Jobs, for instance, um, it literally described how most of the technologies back then were just like bricks. And then he wanted to do something new and people thought he was crazy. Mm -hmm. um, by just by just creating a nice design and then I find out that you're obviously pioneering most of these designs so, so how did you end up in this and why are you doing this why are you focusing so much on design and not on the engineering part which obviously you do as well but yeah tell us uh, that's a great question I mean one of the words that comes to mind is the one you just used to define Steve Jobs and that is kind of crazy um, I'm excited by crazy things, crazy experiences, crazy, inno crazy innovation. I love the magic that technology can offer. Um, and I, you know, I've always felt as, ever since I was a little kid, the sense that art and design can, can move people. It's what makes you feel alive. And I had this natural proclivity to just go in that direction. It was just like an inner calling for me to do what I do. And then when I see the, the joy in people's faces, the end users, that rarely know where this work comes from. 
they don't they don't really care but they do care about the experience they care about the brand they care about the benefit that this this proposal of a usage in the form of a product or a service or a digital experience is providing to them they care deeply about that when it is crafted properly when it is when it's just hitting all the right emotional notes for you as an end user that that's just something that's very special. And you know, when I look around, you mentioned you go in the store and most of the stuff is designed by us. That's not the case, but we've designed a lot of stuff. But I like to think that- Well, most of the stuff I like is this. Okay, by there you, you go. I found out. <laughs> Thank you. You know, we try to transcend all of the consumerist, um, quite frankly, there's a lot of junk out there. And we just never, let ourselves produce just another dubious product that might sell well at first but has very little lasting impact on one's life we like to make an effect on lives a positive effect sometimes you do that by first creating this um, tantalizing identity in the form of maybe an aesthetic or a material presence that a product might present to you upon first exposure these are subliminal messages that are sent to you as a buyer. But then you must create the follow through, the functionality, the user experience that makes sense, that's relevant to what your needs are, your life, your lifestyle, who you are, your identity as, as an end user. So design is actually much more complex than people think at first. It's not just about making something pretty or functional. It's really, it's something much more complex than that that ultimately goes toward forming a good design goes to form a perception in one's mind of generally about quality, goodness, uh, betterment, uh, solutions, all of which then provide kind of a, a har ideally this harmonious uh, composition that offers you your a solution to something it might be a small little pain point that's what design is really good at you know we all have a million little problems from the moment we wake up and brush our teeth with that funky little toothbrush that, that doesn't quite work right to your computer to the chairs that you sit in all day to the cars that you drive to the appliances that you use to make your dinner there's these little annoying pain points designers are very good at solving some of those but we're also good at, and we focus on the bigger gestalt, like what's really going on in your world and, and how can we make a difference, a positive difference. Really, that's what design at the end of the day we're trying to do is we're trying to offer this betterment. That's what everybody wants. They want sometimes ease. They want, they want something done a little bit easier, but not lazy. Um, they want productivity performance, efficiency, sustainability, timelessness. These are values that we try to build into every solution that we do, and we simply never compromise on these things. That's how we've been able to maintain consistency in our solutions over the years. And they're just principles that we, we work by as a team and it drives us forward because when you when you're doing that i think you you just can relate more to your your own personal purpose as well as our team group purpose and we can then feel like we are making a dent in the universe you mentioned steve jobs he used to say that all the time yeah i uh had so much to unpack um a lot obviously about what you mentioned about design, but I actually want to unpack the first thing you said. At one point you're mentioning your inner calling or something that started driving you. I usually, if I look back maybe at my history or some of my team, that calling doesn't happen right away or overnight. Usually maybe there's a moment uh, or several moments that lead up to getting that passion in, in your case, engineering and design, but also just passion is usually not enough. Um, so my question to you is, 
when did you start really getting into combining design and engineering? When did you start getting passionate about everything? You know, I didn't, uh, I didn't have one flash moment. It was more growing into it. But I can tell you that when I was 10 years old or even less, you know, I was drawing constantly all day long and I would even get out rulers and, and draw little advanced spaceships. You know, when I saw 2001 A Space Odyssey, I was like, I want to do that kind of stuff. That is, that's the future. That's cool. But I was, I was just a little kid when I saw that, but it was just, it was a really momentous um, experience for me. Um, I was also a tinkerer. And you know it, when you're a tinker and you're a maker, you just do it automatically. You know, by the time I was 14 or 15, I was taking apart every appliance in my house. Um, <laughs> Did you break and, stuff? I remember my parents oh, getting quite God, mad at me. <laughs> yeah, I would break it, but I would, my challenge was to make it work again. And I just found that challenging. And I started to take apart combustion engines and I didn't realize the learning that was actually happening by me destroying something. Um, or, or just, I remember just being incredibly curious. Curiosity feeds right into passion. If you're a really curious person, you will eventually become very passionate about something. I, I, that grew into making uh, kind of some dangerous things, some go-karts and helicopter with two lawnmower engines on it. And How did uh, you make a helicopter? Well, it failed, but <laughs> yeah, I, strapped two uh, vertical shaft combustion engines onto a platform that I had geared to a vertical um, rotational pole with some propellers that I had made. I didn't go anywhere, but it sure spun around. I almost cut my head off. Wait, but your parents allowed you to do, they were you know what? My you were this? this is This is the source of, another source of my, this unfettered creativity that I've had is my parents. They they really felt like they had to give me space. They had to let me just do these experiments. Um, some of these experiments got kind of dangerous. I was also interested in um, explosives. I was interested in pyrotechnics. So I, I first started making smoke bombs and that led to real bombs. And you know, imagine me in Ohio in the suburbs of Cincinnati growing up, here I had I was lighting off bombs when I was like 14 and 15. These were huge, huge explosions. Combined with four go-karts made from scratch, there was no internet, so you, you know, there was no guide, there was no kit that I made, they were all from scratch. I was like- So how did you make it? What, you go-karts and bombs and things? Well, yeah, obviously if I <laughs> want to build something, I go on YouTube or Google, but Back then, I mean, did you go to the library? I can imagine there are not really books describing how to build a go-kart or a helicopter. No, it's just, I think, again, it's just uh, when you're the curious type, you just observe and you can put it together. And if you're interested in, you know, mechanics and physics, then it just, it, you kind of go step by step, right? You know, it's like, okay, four wheels, cars have four wheels, and I know I need to make the front ones move so I can steer you work your way backwards and design is kind of like that. You know, I still do that. You, you string truths together and it's a little bit sometimes like maybe um, a scavenger hunt where you get a clue, you go to the place, you're, oh, I have a discovery. That's a truth. From there, you move to the next step. You know, so, okay, I got my steering worked out. Now I got to stop this thing. How can I stop this? I need to put resistance against those wheels somehow. So I cobbled together a piece of angle iron on hinges and had a push bar and a pedal and I had levers. So they were cobbled together and they were really cool looking. I have videos of me when I was 12 and 13 years old on a go-kart that went about 50 miles an hour. Wow, um, that you it built. Just, it was just like, I wanted to do it and you gotta do it. I think that's one of the keys to success actually is just one being curious, that starts your passion and then acting on the passion, actually focusing and going after it and not letting anyone tell you, you can't get there. To be internally driven like that, it's, that was really, I think, a gift um, combined with the encouragement that my parents always gave me. They never said, oh, Dan, you can't 
don't go out, go out in the street with your go-kart. Um, they did get a little upset about the bombs, though. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, back then there was nothing like um, the laws that we have now. So surprisingly, you know, we'd let one of those off, me and my buddy, and be a huge explosion in the suburbs. And we'd wait for 15 minutes. Mm, no sirens. I guess we can light off another one. <laughs> I, it was a different time, a different world. And surprisingly, we got away with that until we did get caught. And, um, you know, we didn't hurt anybody. We didn't hurt ourselves, luckily. Uh, but it was, I just remember the discovery. That's what I got into. It's like, oh, my God, we made, we were able to go from pure smoke to a bang. We went from a bang to a boom. And we went from a boom to, like, burying it and lifting earth. Uh, we were just experimenting. And we didn't really have people telling us not to do it. Um, I think that's a lot, that's, that's pretty important when you think about creativity and how you express yourself as a creative person. We're also influenced today by, did I get a thumbs up or down? Uh, will people accept me? Do my peers like me? You know, I think you just, you just shouldn't care about that. Just, just go for it. You know, just have fun. Creativity is just a blast. It, it feels liberating in so many ways because it comes from within sometimes when you're creating something this has never been done before never been done so you are manifesting something from nothing in most cases you're putting combinations together and you're using maybe different configurations in a different way sometimes the same way musicians will craft um, a song and maybe borrow this chord set and this riff uh, and put a new spin on it Nonetheless, it feels good to create, and whether it is music, fine art, design, engineering, writing, um, I think creativity is a lifestyle. For me, I found out that creativity was my lifestyle when I was like, right, 19 or 20 years old is when I really became focused on design. So I was able to channel that young energy and encouragement from my parents into design schools. So my, my explosions as I started to become a designer were more about revelations about the way that people interact with things in their life, the way that they have relationships with artifacts, the way that these artifacts can then give them satisfaction and pleasure and ultimately make a contribution toward even their happiness or their well-being. And that fascinated me that you can, as a an individual. Um, Can you maybe elaborate more about why design? Why not first engineering and then design? What was it about design that you pretty much could channel everything? Yeah, designers are inspired from within. And the type of internal inspiration that I've always felt was more as an artist. I was more interested in like, discovering something about myself and expressing my emotionality, I guess. Um, I was curious, of course, about how things worked, which is more of an engineering kind of thinking. And I was interested in mechanisms. But more prominently, I was interested in, like, how can I move someone with an expression? And art does that beautifully. I was so inspired by all kinds of fine art, you know, first impressionism, and that led to abstract work, abstract expressionism. New York School of Abstract Expressionism just completely blew my mind when I saw it because they were not borrowing figurative material. They weren't borrowing a person sitting there or fruit on a table or a landscape in order to make you think that you're um, in an environment or um, borrowing things that make you feel a certain way. So I, it was purely um, expressionary in its form. And that's, that just really blew my mind that you can, you can really make someone feel the way that, that, um, that, you, that you, any way you want, depending on how you, how you put the medium down. Um, it sounds to me like what it attracted you to then abstract art is the fact that what you said, the discovery factor, whereas 
if you paint maybe like a fruit or something there isn't much to discover i mean you can still discover things but it's not the same as starting from nothing with an abstract art um, but i guess i still don't see why you just didn't continue in the art why engineering to me seems like yes. such a different thing and also a little bit more work and dirtier and uh, um and whereas art is just well i guess art can be uh if you paint a lot very dirty as well but but why why just not focus on one thing get really good at that why combine it with engineering you know something about machines just fascinated me i was just again very curious about the way that things worked and looked and so there is a strong focus in industrial design on both of these things it is those combined um so did also, you study did you went on studying after abstract or was were you studying and did you feel like something wasn't enough and you decided to I've, you know, I felt, I think when I was in high school, you know, I was doing a lot of painting. I was kind of the artist of my high school. I was doing a lot of surrealistic work and pretty wild, weird stuff. <laughs> um, I felt it was very internal and I love working with people. And again, I had this tug, this fascination with the way that things work. And I think that partly came from working on my go-karts and working on cars. I've always been fascinated with cars and um, I, it just seemed like there was more opportunity to have a fuller life and fuller expression. And then also a, a career, you know, because people need things in, their, in right. their life. And when you're a young artist, you're not sure like, okay, am I going to be able to make a living doing this? Right. Do I want to be in a studio my whole life by myself? So I really felt like it was an opportunity to have everything all in one. And uh, it turned out to be the case. Um, and you know, I still paint. I paint almost every weekend now. Um, it's a nice outlet for me. And I do like that feeling that oh, I'm a little bit of an anxious, lonely feeling when you're standing in front of a very large piece of blank canvas. and you're waiting for your internal voice to give you some signal as to a composition, a color palette, maybe just pure emotion that you want to express. Um, it's, and then of course there's no client telling you, you know, giving you all this requirement and yeah. criteria on what to do. So it's, um, it so feels how very do you, How do you free. stimulate that process? What, what's actually happening in your mind when you're there? In a there's a blank canvas it's the weekend and and right now the voice is still quiet i'm assuming so what is the process what's happening you know you first you have to be in the mood for it there are days when i woke up when i when i wake up and it's clear like i have to create and i want to paint and i might have a vision of something i may have dreamed it and it's a starting point only and once you start laying this down the work then speaks back to you. You begin to have a conversation between what's being expressed on the canvas and what's being expressed in your mind. And you try to reconcile these two. You work together with it. And it goes on a journey. It's, it's a bit like taking a walk in the woods, you know, where you don't really know what you're going to expect. At least is my approach. Everybody's different. Yeah. Um, and you might turn a corner and see something is, oh yeah, that's an idea. I'm going to move it toward that direction. Give it more saturation, more depth, uh, change the composition. I, you know, there's, it, to me, it's just, it's pure exploration and discovery and it feels very natural to me. Um, I, and you know, it, the other thing is, I don't know really where creativity comes from. I mean, sometimes I'll sit down with a piece of paper and a general idea on something, on how to solve a problem, and I start letting my hands do the wandering. I'm drawing, thinking, diagramming, doing overlays, trying different things, and you go, oh, oh, there's, there's an idea. There's, the, and you try that, you try this vein, and sometimes this vein doesn't go anywhere. Sometimes you need to pull back and go in a completely different direction. But then when you do start to resonate with something, that feeling, 
is so euphoric. I mean, it is sheer absolute joy when you feel like I'm on to something and this has never been done before. Then you carry it forward. I'm driven by the expected result. I can see it and I get super excited to then fully externalize it. In other words, get it in a cab, make beautiful renderings, make models and prototypes that work and look great, and then ultimately go to tooling. And then when you go to the store, like you mentioned, you go to the store and there it is. Oh my God, these, there are various steps of this euphoria that occur as you perfect, change, iterate, perfect, change, iterate, and move a product closer and closer to the ultimate gift, which is that moment when an end user consumer comes along and makes a decision to purchase it, own it, live with it for a long time, and they get satisfaction from it. I actually get a kick out of um, products that, that I maybe had worked on like 15 or 20 years ago, and then you see them after 15 or 20 years, like what people have done with them. Can you I'll give an forget. example? I'd love to yeah, sure. That. I remember... Um, I was at a recycling center and I was taking a bunch of electronic waste. And I looked in the bottom of this big bin and there was a corner of a toaster, literally a corner. But when you create products, they're all your babies, right? So I, I might not remember the client's name or even maybe the client, but I don't remember that design that I worked on because it's so personal. Yeah. And so I looked at the corner of that toaster. And I'm like, I worked on that like 10 years ago. And I reached down and I lifted it up by the cord. It was so used and hopefully loved during its time. It had had a patina on it. I don't know how much toast had been through that toaster, but we're talking at least probably 12 years worth of toast. Clearly it was used and, and hopefully enjoyed. And that gave me a little bit of satisfaction. Yes, it was in the dump. That's something you have to deal with as an industrial designer. Sometimes your products end <laughs> up in the dump, especially when you're working with technology and you know, it's, it will become obsolete if it's tech. Not all products, uh, obviously. You know, when you're designing certain pieces of furniture and lighting, I mean, they could be around forever. And, um, but I think we all creators deal with this idea of impermanence. Um, Everything is that way anyway in our lives. So I think that it's better to make an impact on the world by providing meaningful experiences that maybe mitigate a little bit of that sense of impermanence that we all have. And um, that, that, that brings me some real joy. Actually, I wanted to ask you a different question regarding the painting, but you touch something really interesting because um, you don't only design tech, you've obviously designed a toaster. And when you get a task like that, a client comes to you, how is that process like? And I'm, I'm meaning like the kind of everyday objects. There's so many toasters. Why hmm. would they kind of come to you for a different toast? And, I guess it's like you wake up on a Saturday and just like painting on a canvas, you have to now redesign um, this toaster. So how do you do that? It sounds to me very much like you're almost taking the first principle approach that physics teaches you where you don't actually look at the other toasters, but you start thinking on your own. D d am I right? Or how do you, do you know, that? you have to, I take kind of a dual track. Uh, the first track is, a more emotive one that I would call design seeing. The second track is more design thinking. Uh, design seeing to me is important to get out first. I go down this track first and that is, what do I feel about this brand? What do I feel about the act of make, making toast? It's so banal when you think about it. Yeah. But what can you, what can I do to make this experience a little bit more enjoyable? Or um, how can I make a, a different uh, solution that, that makes one take notice and makes someone feel proud maybe? Because you know, at the end of the day, you, people are buying products like uh, little tokens of uh, personal declaration or identity declaration. It's like, oh, did you see my cool 
phone. You know, everybody holds their Google phone up or their iPhone. That's me. You know, I believe in this. So we all have this, whether you realize it or not, you make these decisions about all the products in your life and something at the end of the day will appeal to you. Sometimes you don't know what it is. It's a subconscious connection that you have. It, it might be influenced by the brand, you know, like in the case we were working with Sunbeam. Some people think, oh, that's a big American company. You know, I really am attracted to that brand. Others will be attracted purely to the industrial design. Then there are also types of people that might be attracted to the specifications, like the width of the uh, slots or the wattage. Uh, there are more the fulfilled types, as Stanford Research Institute calls them, um, that would look at the specs on something. You have to take all of that into consideration. Again, all part in the, in the seeing part of your problem solving process. And then I like to just try certain things, just uh, lay down some sketches that are just uh, notions that I might have. And they're not reasoned out necessarily, but they're raw and they're real. It's the artist in you speaking when you're doing that. Then of course you have the pragmatic reasoning that comes from the design thinking side. This is design that is informed by research. What do people really want? What are the demographics telling us? There's a lot of evidence when you're designing a product about like where you really probably should go so that you have a higher chance or higher opportunity to succeed with a product. Some of it is just data you need to sift through. Yeah. Um, you need to work with engineers to determine like, okay, what are the limitations, the givens and the limitations. And again, as I was talking about truths before, sometimes the truth would be like we we're talking about painting. The truth is, okay, I've got a four by five canvas and it's flat. It's going to hang on a wall. That's a truth, right? Toaster, it's going to be AC powered and it probably doesn't want to be that much bigger than the bread itself. Um, it's going to have some means of controlling it. And these are things that you can kind of put together in a framework, which gives you at least a starting point on a design. And then when you really start to bring the seeing and the thinking together, they begin to merge and hopefully transcend and become more than the sum of these two parts. And that's when your design starts to really sing. And you have a lot of trial and error. You go through so many different options. You know, designing a toaster, we will sketch 200 toasters, 200 different ideas. Some are outrageous, weird toasters. The, the toast is horizontal and it's floating <laughs> above the counter. Um, others are super simple and very austere the way that Apple would design it. Uh, we, we really try to get it out of our system knowing darn well when you're sketching something that, okay, well, that's not going to be it, but I'm going to finish the sketch anyway, because sometimes a client needs to see what they don't want to produce as much as what they do want to produce. It gives them a sense of confidence and security that what we're about to invest in tooling and potentially five or more years of production is indeed the right way to go. And so do you show your client 200 sketches? You know, we often will. We some design firms say, "Oh no, you only need to show like two or two or six or whatever." We'll make a recommendation, but we like to show the process, what we have been through. The, there's so much more appreciation for the design process when they get to see your adventures, your struggles, all of the challenges. They, they like to see the dead ends, and when you have a real good relationship with a client. You can tell them, honestly, you know, we tried this weird thing over here and there's something about it that we really love and that might be the next gen product. Let's just couch that for the moment because we need to get this product that you're expecting now out in the market. Let's, let's have that build rev a revenue stream so that you can afford to go tool this one up. But we always try to get our clients into this dream state where, where they, their imaginations are launched. I love to see us take the, the mindset of the client, it just, when we catapult that to a place where they just had no idea that, that, that they had the, the ability to think in a different way about themselves. I think designers are actually really good therapists because we do bring together kind of marketing 
engineering the vision from a CEO or, or C-suite individuals that might have big dreams about where to take the company. Designers, we create composition, that's what we do. And you want that composition to sound as good as a symphony. Uh, but you're working with a lot of different moving parts. We're talking people, it's not just things, it's not just materials that we're designing, it's we're designing scenarios, we're getting people to work together on a mission to create something great. And throughout that process, you need everyone's help, collaborative help, to make this thing that you might have in your head as a designer actually happen, actually manifest. I believe in that manifestation so much that it, it to me, is what drives me forward. Because if, if you're not getting your design values out there in the world, and our mechanism for expressing and, and manifesting our values is mass production. That's when you actually put real products in a real end user's hands that has benefit to them. Now you're affecting lives and you try to do it like, you know, death by a million cuts. It's a Chinese term, death by a yeah. thousand cuts, I think it is. You know, just get out there. Yeah, there's another user that's been um, satisfied and then another one. And now you're bringing your values out. Now you're starting to make a difference. When you do just a rendering and you put it on your website, it's cool to get a design out, but I hate when you've got a great design and it's, it doesn't really fully productize or actualize. I think actualization in design is, is really key. Um, so therefore, when you understand that it's also, design is not just the business of creating these artifacts and digital experiences, but it's also a it's almost psychology, you know, you're, it's, it's a narrative that you create between people that, that are, again, on this mission to create something great. So you're pretty much, if I summarize it, you are creating, um, you start off with looking at how to create an experience that people can be proud of and emotionally involved in. And then secondly, you will look at the data and the research and how to make sure that that which you thought of can succeed. Yeah, because you do have these pragmatic you know, requirements, uh, criteria that must be met. You know, you, you have to face the cost constraint, for example. You might have the biggest idea about the coolest innovation you've ever thought of, but you know, if if it's just not acceptable, the people won't pay that much for it, well, then it's, it's not going to make it. So you have to know as a designer what you're heading into with a particular concept. You, you, need, to, you need to be a fortune teller in a, in a way and guide your client to the place. And if you really feel that the biggest return on the creativity, the ROC and the ROI are linked, the return on the investment in design can be linked and it's up to you by, by implementing the more outrageous, more expensive design. It's up to you as a designer to persuade your client like, okay, and use data. You, no, you can't just go and say, well, I think people are going to buy this. <laughs> no, sometimes you need to be a lot more constructive in how you present an idea. And this requires backup. You need backup as a designer. And that's evidence that this will succeed. And you can look at and, and compare and contrast to uh, trends, um, maybe best practices in the industry, uh, maybe more because we work in so many different industries, housewares, medical, industrial, we can actually pull evidence from one industry and say, you know what, this worked really well over here, even though it's completely unrelated. We did a medical product that influenced an oil filter, for example. Yeah. And because we had the evidence of performance, efficacy, and viability when it came to like ultimately crafting a cost strategy, it was easier to sell it. And uh, sometimes you see it before your client. We often, designers often see this a vision on where to take a product or a system before your client does. I think partly because of the, sometimes your naivete you're, you're not over constrained by a, a dogma in a particular profession. We like to come in very fresh 
you know, it's throw out a completely outrageous and surprising solution that at first will shock your client, but then when they think about it, you think about it, you prove it. Again, you prove it. That's why we also have engineering uh, because you don't want to be like, oh, they're the industrial designers that are coming in in their black shirts <laughs> and telling us how to design something. You know, you have to win their trust and work with clients. It's so important to listen, to have a back and forth, to just learn, 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 and don't be afraid to say, I don't know how we're going to do that. Don't be, also, don't be afraid to be totally natural in, in your expression of your passion. I'll get so darn excited in some meetings. At first, people say, oh my God, he's got such a big ego or something like that. Like, no, no, no. I, I ego is like tiny. It's, it's more about getting to the heart of the matter. And when you realize there's so much magic in our world that just putting the new combination together is not as hard as people make it. So I'm super interested after what I've just kind of learned, what is your opinion then on the Tesla's like cyber truck? Because that just doesn't make sense. Like, there are so <laughs> many jokes and memes on the internet. How can you present that to somebody and be like, oh, this is going to like, how can you back that up with evidence? Because if you follow the train of thought that you're just presenting, that designer must have gone to Tesla and been like, here is the evidence, but but where? Well, What's they did this intern they did it internally. They've got a design team inside. When I first saw it, I must say, I was like, what the hell? You know. <laughs> uh, however, it's a big world, it's a big market. There are some people, and it's very polarizing that design. There are some people that are gonna just eat that up. They fell in love with it immediately. I actually fell in love with it, I have to say. It looks so different. See? But I just, I I do think a child drew it. But it's so different that you kind of want to have it. You know what? A child uh, could have drawn an iPhone. If you look at a Cybertruck and you say a child could draw that, yes, there's something very primitive. It's, you know, an iPhone is a rectangle. The, the excellence and the genius comes through in the detailing in, in the way that they conceived this piece of technology, the way it's machined and the, the gorilla glass and the joints and the seams and the feel of the buttons, it's all in the details and it succeeds. If the Cybertruck delivers on that, if it is safe, if it's um, as rugged and tough as they say it is, if they can get around the utilitarian uh, limitations that a form like that might have in regards to like fitting things in the back of the truck where the, the back is angled like this, but how do you fit a four by sheet of plywood in there? Yeah. Um, they might pull it off and there will be people that are going to have this just because it's different. Again, sometimes design succeeds because it's different. We all want to make a statement. Many of us want to make a statement. Have and you had designs where you wanted to make a statement and create a something like that where it was just so different oh my gosh yes can you it's give so story? much fun uh, there are several on our website um, there's all kinds of products that we have designed where they are different I love being unique and different in our design solutions the key to making these very different designs successful is to make them also functional so that you get over the hump of consumers uh, or end users basically saying, well, you know, I think it's really different, but we've all had this feeling like you're shopping and you're like, oh, you know what? I really love this briefcase, but there are no internal components. It's so unique. I love the form, but there's no internal components and I have to fit my computer in there and all my, my billfold and this papers and this and that. So you talk yourself out of this unique design because it's not offering you the follow through, which is the function. You have usually have a, a some type of problem to solve, and there will be some contractors that are going to look at that cyber truck and say, "Oh man, that's so cool! I'm going to pull up into a job site. I'm going to be hot stuff." Oh my gosh, how am I going to fit my plywood in the back? What about my ladder? How am I going to strap the ladder to the top? Now they might very well come out with brackets and accessories that solve all those problems. I hope they do, but. I've always felt like, and that's one of the reasons we have engineering, is to like have the follow through. Yes, be unique. 
do great design. Be inspired as an artist first, as a designer, but work it out because you don't want to create more superfluous junk that ends up in the, in the dump after a year or it gets set aside. How many products that you have, that you have now that are set aside in drawers? I mean, people are, we have such a strange relationship with, with artifacts that we are purchasing now. It's, the relationship is very fleeting. A lot of times people buy products and use them and they discard them or set them aside, put them in their drawer and they're just never seen again. Um, it reminds me of how people are consuming Instagram content or TikTok videos. Um, there's just so much stuff available to you to purchase. So you need to be, I think good design then ultimately helps you with discernment as a consumer. It helps you understand when, you, when you're making a value purchase because the design expresses itself, it communicates to you the values that you really want. And it's evident. I like design that's self-evident. It's speaking to you. Sometimes it's, it's a silent speak. It's something we all understand. You don't have to be a designer to understand it. It might be in the way that something is beckoning you to touch it. Talk about that briefcase. Like that particular material, I've never seen that before. What do you want to do? You want to touch it. That's okay. That's good. You want to. I want to open it up. I want to see more. It's pulling you in. It's an invitation. The product design is actually pulling you in as a consumer. And the final punchline is when your biggest concern, and that might be like, okay, I need to make sure my computer is protected in this bag. You open that up and you see, oh my gosh, they have like quilted diamond pattern, protective internal surface. It's tiny little brand mark and just the right kind of fastener. And it makes just the right kind of sound. That's the punchline. That's the moment when you say, this is going to work for me. This is good design. If, on the other hand, you open up that bag and you see this raw, unfinished interior yeah, uh, yeah, it's kind of a cool looking bag, but mm, it, it doesn't really deliver. And then you're going to go to the next offering. So design has to be complete that way. Design needs to speak sometimes very boldly, sometimes very subtle, like the notebook that's in front of me. It's all very subtle. It's ergonomically designed. It's just MacBook, right? The touchpad is nice and wide and big. I know exactly how to use it. It's giving me all the right cues. I know where everything is and it's as if it had already existed. And the designer's job was just to find it out there in the world and make it. Sometimes good design is that way. You look at it, you're like, come on, this must have existed already. And no, it hadn't. And I think the best design has that quality of, it's just been a discovery. It's like a fossil in the earth. It's always been there. It's been there for an awful long time. And your, your job as a designer is to go find it and put this combination together. And good design is often like that. It's like, yeah, that's, that's you know, when the Tizio lamp came out, I was looking at it, like, oh my God, there's a balance. There's another balance. It swivels. It does everything I want it to do. Wow, how long has this been around? No, a designer invented it. So, so this is, I mean, I guess the question that pops up for me is what you're describing now good design you have to start as an artist but you have to follow through as an engineer because if the tesla cybertruck comes out now mm -hmm. it kind of achieved what the artist wanted to achieve which is creating a statement but it needs to have that follow through so that people who buy it can actually use it and then you have a potential 12 years later type of product that you find in the dumpster super used y yes and no uh, for me, I, I think everybody's different, right? So for me, I usually start with my, ins my inspiration usually starts with maybe you could say more of this artistic calling, if you will. Other designers start with an engineering principle and they work with it. The important thing is to understand you need both. Um, ideally, good design will be inextricably 
linked where, where the aesthetics and the function, the form and function and experience are all so inseparable. You can't really say, well, that the appearance stops here and the function stops and starts here. You want it to all work together so seamlessly and obviously that you appreciate all of it. There are, there are also fantastic, uh, brilliant design. I mean, like look at Thomas Edison. He was an engineer, but he was so inspired about what he was trying to do for the end user as far as uh, some, a completely new experience. Uh, Buckminster Fuller was one of these designers that was first an engineer and, and then an artist. And he understood that you need both. You know, it, the personalities of designers and engineers are often very different. And it's been a l career long like challenge for me to get engineers and designers to work together, to talk, to solve problems together. Can you share um, maybe a story of um, like some a product that you designed that just went crazy, where the where it went all over the world and the functionality and the design was so everything was in sync, but also something that just flopped so badly, where, but you were passionate about it. I, I'm I really interested in both of them because me as a creative as well. Um, sometimes you really think you've nailed it and then somehow you know you completely missed out um so can you share those two stories um okay how do i pick among all my children <laughs> you know um, maybe uh one of the the ones that the most popular so that everybody can kind of relate to it maybe they've used it already yeah so um maybe a very recent one is the Brita water pitchers that we designed. Um, Brita had been producing, this was a, it became a hit product very quick because. Wait, you guys designed the, the big jugs or the, the water um, bottles? The, uh, the pitchers, the jugs, yeah, that, oh, that jugs. you would have in your refrigerator. Yeah, we, um, do. <laughs> we actually do. <laughs> so, I mean, that was a product that had been invented in 1965. And the concept was you have a chamber up top, you fill it with water, and then the filter is down in the clean water. And then as you pour, the clean water is supposed to come out. They'd been trying to perfect that over many decades, and people would often make the mistake where they're thirsty. So they pour the top water in. It's trying to make its way through that filter very slowly. But you're thirsty, so you pour the water, and some of the top not-so-good water comes out. And you can't see that water inside because there's this big internal chamber. So um, we worked with them. They asked us to redesign the picture and they asked us to come back after a few weeks of thinking about it and tell them, is the pitcher the hero or is the filter the hero? And we needed to take a stance. They were talking to many different design firms. We came back after two weeks and we said, neither is the hero. Uh, the water is the hero. We need to get the the pitcher out of the way and the filter out of the way. People want to see water. Yes, they want it clean. They want to know that there's something here that is making that water clean, but let's expose all of the water. So by bringing the filter up underneath the spout so it filters as you pour only, it allowed us to have just this big expression of water. So we designed that series of products, became a huge success immediately, and it eclipsed all of the other uh, products that they had had on the market. It makes before. so much sense as well. Of course, it's not the jug or the filter. Like when it's I the use water. the Brita, I want to see the water. That's why it's the water. I drink it. It's so true. Yeah. Um, How did you come up with that insight, though? Because that until you said it and i guess that's kind of like the iphone when it came out until it was there like that did i would never have come up with it so what was the process of realizing something so obvious that wasn't even obvious? you know that's what i love about design is is sometimes you can call out the obvious what do you want with a pitcher well you want to you want the water to be clean but ultimately you want water you're thirsty you want to drink water and you want it you want it now so 
just like sometimes you just have to as a designer you just need to like clear your way through the brush you need to just get a lot of stuff out of the way and some of it is bias a client bias they you know they've been doing it this way forever and you know we did this and we tried that and check this wall thickness and we know we need to have the power supply here and we need a, a cap and a fill you know they'll give you all these requirements but as a designer especially as a consultant you have this opportunity to be totally free in your thinking you can say the dumbest thing in the room and i'll tell you many times that dumbest thing in a room turns into the winningest product in the world you know, like working on Tonal, this uh, strength training system that is on the wall. It's basically a whole gym on the wall. I'll never forget when the founder of that company came over to my house. He had this, um, this motor that he literally clamped onto my dining room table, and there was a cable coming off of this motor. Yeah. And he had the motor connected to his PC, his notebook. He said, Dan, pull on this cable. He had like a little T-bar. I pulled on the camera. Again, I love all these mechanisms, right? So oh, it's going to be cool, right? It's, it's a gadget. So I pulled on this thing and it, yeah, there was pressure. And when I released it, there was even more pressure. Oh, it was pulling back. He was controlling it with his PC. And I was like, this is genius. Um, I want to be a part of this company. We're going to do something great together. Now, I think a lot of people would have said, okay, let's put it inside a, uh, a gym cage. You know, these cages are you sit in to do workouts. Uh, that, that motor that he had was fairly thin. It was like a pancake style, big resistance motor, electromagnetic. So literally my very first thought was to put this on the wall, like your television hanging on the wall and probably use some kind of arms that allowed you to do standing lat pull downs and squats and also butterflies with your hands out here like this. It was a total breakthrough in the way that we think about exercise equipment. And three and a half years later, we shipped that baby. It was a ton of design engineering and UX work, user experience work that went into the development of that product. And look what's happening now. Gyms are closed. Um, yeah, people are, and this true. is, this is going I, to be a lot. I was now. even researching that device. Um, so I was so shocked when I saw that you guys designed it. Yeah, it's, it's just a totally different way of thinking. And it's but really important. I actually want to cover what you said, because you said at one point, the job of a designer is to go through the bushes. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's not even only the job of the designer, because most people that run businesses, no matter how small or big, they always stumble, like there's an obstacle and it's clear that there's so much fog or bushes, like you called it, that like, you have to kind of wade through it, get all the biases out and start taking right decisions, right? Yes. Um, so what is your process? What do you do? What do you do that it's you succeed in doing that? But like, the CEO of the company does not like, what is the process that you, you probably have a formula at this point, I can imagine. We do have a formula. I mean, each client is different, but it generally, I call it esteem. And esteem is an acronym for examine, see, think, explore, evaluate, and make. Each, now that's an oversimplification of what you go through but you start with basically examining what are the conditions? What, you know, what, what is the condition that the client has? What are their business goals and objectives? What are their marketing objectives? What are their engineering capabilities? Do they have a production team somewhere in another part of the world? And then most importantly, what are end users? What is their condition? What is the context in which this product will live? What's its environment of use? What are the preconceptions that the end user has? What's going on inside their minds? Are they worried about something? You know, we've done products, uh, for example, in, in emergency products, emergency mitigation products, where there, people are afraid. Uh, we've done medical products for first responders, and they're concerned about getting something done right now, saving a life right now. 
Uh, we're working on our project right now. It's we're redesigning a surgical product and a procedure. We're not just designing the product. We're we're actually inventing a surgical procedure. It's very intricate. Why, now, why would doctors come to designers to do this? We're not MDs. We are configurators. We are manipulators of material and experience and elements that we bring together in new combinations for a given effect. And yesterday morning, we had this brainstorm where we just invented something so cool in this surgical thing. It will save many lives every day. Talk about a good feeling as, and, as an individual so doing what something. What was that process then? What? Do you just show you know, up a one lot day of, and so, start brainstorming? No. Well, so again, this is related to this the early part of the the design process. We talked to surgeons. Uh, we talked to our client. They were all medical technologists. We are working with. Uh, are we talking like two, three conversations? Like no, like no, many minutes, you, twenty you, minutes long. You you need to get in a lab, you need to get to the hospital, you need to observe, you need to sometimes take video so that you can see it again and again. Some projects that are more complex, you need to internalize this problem. You need to first start with this deep internalization of what a problem is all about. Without that, you're, you're flying blind. You know, you can put your, again, like I said, these artistic notions down about, you know, how you might see something going in the future for a client, but the more complex the problem is, chances are those notions won't actually be right. You might be able to get, again, the general direction, kind of in the right, going in the right way, but you need to really understand what are the usage issues and concerns? What are the real problems going on? And as a designer, sometimes you just need to be with the problem. You need to just be quiet, sit down, listen, watch. Artistic type, Designers have a really good insight. And sometimes when you just watch something happening, watch what a surgeon is doing, watch what an end user is doing when they're pouring water, watch what an end user is doing when they're making toast. All of a sudden you get these little sparks of like, oh, did you see that? Did you see how they're holding that bread? Oh, why are they why are they concerned? The bread is a little too the top of the bread is a little too close to that hot metal part. We need to get that that bottom lifter to advance a little bit more. Uh, look what somebody's going through when they're changing the filter. Why don't we, instead of screwing it off, why don't we do this bayonet mallet because it's just like twist drop. You make these little observations that then feed into solutions later, but you need to start with these sparkling moments of insight. And then it's, uh, you, again, asking a lot of questions. You have to be so inquisitive and so curious that you become annoying. Literally, just keep asking the question. I tell my designers, do you know enough about that? Nope, no, you don't. Oh, what's going on there? Actually, nope. Go dig some more. Dig, dig, dig. I call it an auger. An auger is this slow, wide screw that digs like a fence oh, yeah. post. You know, you have to be like a mental auger and you need to get to the answers. What you're doing is you're really looking for informants. Informants are what guide you as a designer. You're looking for insight but you need the informants to get you to the place where the insights percolate and come to the surface. And so then how it's do you, How do you know when, you, when you've hit it? Obviously, younger designers would, without your experience will think that they know. You just said it. <laughs> but then come to you and apparently they don't. So you tell them, go dig more. What yes. is it about what they say that you think, no, that's not enough? I, that's a great question. I think... Um, certainly life experience helps there and being a very inquisitive person and knowing what, what will likely make a hit with someone. And I'm not talking about a hit product. I'm talking about a, a hit experience. Um, you have so to be what very... are those things you're looking for then in the hit experience? I'm looking for um, all kinds of things like... Um, one, and this initially, I'm usually looking for an innovation on how something is actually going to work. Usually you can massage a functional thing to make it look a certain way later. It's harder to find this like real 
utilitarian advantage, like an invention on how something is going to work that is truly unique. Because if you start the other way, if you start with the aesthetics, I'm going to create this most inspired form you've ever seen in your life. By the time you you enforce the functionality onto it, it changes into a Frankenstein product that just nobody wants, right? So I like to first start with, again, exposing these truths and then building upon those through a series of iterative steps. So I'm looking for like, okay, is that gonna work better? Is it smaller? Um, will it use less energy to manufacture? Um, will it offer a new kind of material advantage? Um, there are also other things, you know, like proportionally where the configuration is so clunky that it's like, okay, that's just not gonna work, right? If you're designing a, uh, an appliance and it's just not gonna fit in the standards of, of what the kitchen world wants, and you're like, okay, that's probably a stupid idea. Thanks for putting it down, but it's kind of a stupid idea. So you're looking for things that, that just, again, begin to have like their own heartbeat. A design will kind of come to life. I love that moment when you're starting to see that heartbeat. It's like this embryonic, there's something here. This is cool. And I'm the first one in the office to blurt it out like, and I'll use bad words too, because <laughs> design is exciting. I will let out an expression to let everybody know, come here, we're onto something. And it's usually that ultrasound heartbeat of a, of a solution, and it's starting to come alive. The, now you have to give it the conditions where that life can then foster and grow and really begin to take life and then ultimately a personality. This is an extraordinary journey that you go through as a creator, and that's what drives me forward every single day. I go into work looking for that those moments. Yes, I have to run the business and sometimes do proposals and deal with a people problem, of course, but really what I get jazzed about is the act of design itself because of all of this intrinsic power that it has, the intrinsic power to give life, to empower something, to empower an idea, and to give it flight. This is... It, it's one of the most extraordinary things that people can be doing, if you think about it. It's what every great innovation in the world went through. You don't realize it, but, you know, the designers of the 747, you know, they, when the request from TWA came, came along, the CEO of TWA took out a long rope and he gave it to the CEO of Boeing. They were at the conference room at the uh, Pan Am Center in New York City. And he's like, I want a jumbo jet that's as wide as this, this room. And, and the CEO, and I challenge you to that. The CEO of Boeing said, okay, well, let me, let's document that. So they got a rope and they span it across the room. And it was like, I don't know, 35 feet or whatever, whatever <laughs> it is. And the Boeing CEO, McCauley, I think he was at the time, he raveled up that rope. And he took it back to his engineer and said, we need to make a jumbo jet and it's this diameter. And those engineers were like, what, are you crazy? You know, yeah, that's what our customer wants. Pan Am wants this. I said, TWA, Pan Am. And they did it. And believe me, there were so many, that kind of joy of creativity and the, the revelations that occur not just one or two, it's, it's every day you get these revelatory moments where you know your design has just been advanced. Bing, 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 you know, each step. It's like, yeah, that's it. Okay, that made it even better. You just have to know when you've made a step backwards. Sometimes you're advancing a design and you start adding all these features. And you're like, oh, you know what? It doesn't have that same energy that it did yesterday. When do you know that it's too much? Because I, obviously, we do a lot of videos and movie making commercials. And at one point, you know, you start adding effects and more effects. And I notice when new interns come in, um, they tend to, when they've mastered how effects work, they tend to just throw so many effects on it. So what is your advice on when is it too much? When do you have to dial it back? And yeah. You know, part of that comes through experience, knowing, you know, when you go through this a lot, you kind of know that, uh, you know, I tried something like that five years ago on a product and it, 
it didn't work out as well as I thought. Um, and the other is just kind of an intrinsic understanding about uh, two things. One is physics, like, okay, now we're really pushing the boundaries of physics or we're not doing enough physics. We're not pushing the boundaries of physics enough. Sometimes the technology you need, if you want it really to be magical, you need to, you need to go beyond, man. You need, to, you need to push a lot of buttons to get it to go to a place where you want it to go. And sometimes it's hard work. The other is intrinsically knowing when you have a solution that will truly appeal to that end user. And this is the psychological side. The psychological side of design is, is it just this, that, that's I think the hardest thing for a lot of young designers especially to get. Um, and it helps to talk to people a lot, to travel, to be the learned type, to really understand people is when you begin to understand design and it helps you with your decision making. Um, I fall back on that a lot. Just knowing how people think and feel about their world and how they can so readily embrace certain kinds of solutions versus others. Um, and I, I think, and then there's a lot of gray area in between these, the, the, the physics and then the, this emotive uh, appeal. Yeah, and then the other is just kind of instinct. I, I got to say, I, I don't even sometimes know where this stuff comes from. I think most, most artists, whether they're musicians, painters, or designers, would probably tell you, it's like, hey, you know, after a while, you kind of, you kind of get it. And then you, when you're doing it, it's, it just, it's something speaks to you. It's, um, I think you need to remove the barrier between your, your conscious and subconscious. That really does help. There's a lot of knowledge within all of us. And a big challenge is to just make that barrier that we all have to our subconscious a little more permeable so that you can reach down. We all have this. We were born with it. Even animals are born with it. How does, how does a dog know how to do what it does after, after being alive for a month? It's intrinsic. It's in our DNA. And I think design and problem solving and manipulating the world around us so that we can survive is intrinsic in our DNA. I think design is very intrinsic within all of us. It's, it's innate. And a lot of people just try to overthink it. To, they overthink being an artist. They'll stand in front of that canvas. They'll sit in front of their, their typewriter or their, you know, the proverbial artist that struggles or the writer that struggles. You try to get into this creative laminar flow where everything is speaking to you simultaneously you, and you are comfortable with what your conditions are. You accept the, the difficulties and the truths that you're going to be faced with on a particular project. And you just become one with it. And when you do, then all of these intrinsic capabilities within you start to come forward. They become revealed and then all of a sudden solutions start flying out of you. I, I love that feeling. After I'm with a problem for a few weeks, even though it could be a really hairy one, after a few weeks, it sort of all comes together somehow and you begin to solve the problem and it's like, everything's just working. And when you're leading a design team, you need to get everybody into that mood, if you will, or into that state of, of creative laminar flow. And when you're doing it together as a team, remarkable, remarkable things can happen because you're building upon one another's ideas. I, I, I live for those moments as, as a designer. It's, it's the true, that's the sheer joy of design. Right do you there. feel do you feel after what you've described that you have to be almost born with this um, almost <laughs> art inside of you or do you feel like it's something you can learn and I think this question comes maybe from I've seen so many startups pass through our events and you always get this feeling that they got this bug from Apple and Steve Jobs and designing and they want to create the next iPhone and 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 I would kind of if I hear your story it almost sounds like not everybody can do this 
What, what is your opinion on that? Um, I think that at least I can only speak from my own reality because each of us have our own reality. After all, all reality exists inside your own head. Even this reality, it's all happening inside my head. Speaking very personally, I felt like I was born with this because sometimes I don't know. I mean, I can sh certainly, you know, I've, I've sought to gain knowledge and I've had experiences that have certainly fed into who I am as a creative person. But I definitely felt, have always felt like I was born with it. Even my parents were like, whoa, you're, you're like, asking us how the universe works. And you're four years old, Dan, what's going on? My parent, my mom would always laugh when I would ask these crazy questions, but she would always try to answer them, which is really a, fantastic. Um, what, did your parents, some, what did your parents do? Uh, what, what is their background? My dad was an entrepreneur. Um, my mother studied psychology and she basically was a housewife. She raised her four kids and gave us the kind of nurturing and love unconditionally that made us all very secure. Uh, none of us, even to this day, the, of the four kids, we don't really care what other people think. Uh, we've all actualized on our own dreams. And um, I think that was a really incredible foundation to have. But, you know, the other side to design, there is a lot to learn. Of course, there are aspects in design, because the world des of design is huge, right? So yes, you can learn many different techniques. You can learn process. You can learn uh, different research, research methodologies. You can learn engineering principles. You can learn to be a pretty good designer, but you might not be that inspired designer where you just like, voila, I don't know. You come in the office, I, I got it, guys, I got it. <laughs> um, you might not be that type, uh, but you know, it takes, it takes all types, right? It's not, it's not just the, it's not just the Van Goghs that made the painting world, right? It's, you, you need the, the paint makers and the canvas makers and the, all the different expressions and styles. I mean, that's the beauty of creativity where it's like, there's, there's almost like not a wrong way to do it. It's, it can be personal. It can be collective. It can, it can be pioneering, it can be incremental, and it's all good. Throughout your story, you, every time um, we're kind of hitting a note, you're always mentioning, and I, I kind of understand that because a lot um, comes from you were born with it. Um, and so you're always saying from experience, from experience. Mm. I guess my question is, um, experience comes from failure. And that's how I learned it. So if you look back, um, again, we covered like the product that went really well and your gut feeling really hit it on the nail. But let's take the other end. Like what can you share a similar story? Uh, maybe something that we know or don't know, uh, but we can relate to where it just, you were really passionate about it, but it just, it didn't work. Um, and what you learned from that, because yeah, sure. I think that's definitely at my kind of phase in my career, I tend to do stuff that either goes really well, or I just do stuff and it just still goes bad. And there, I'm still not at the level where the experiences are apparently hitting, you know, 100% uh, efficiency or something like that. But right. So what, what are those failures or stories that you can share? I think the, maybe the, f the first part of my answer would be like what failure means to me and many designers. I think our society thinks too often about success and failure as binary antonyms, opposites. And you're either successful or you're a failure. <laughs> I have a, a completely opposite viewpoint on this, Be partly because design is a, by its very nature, what you go through because you have to explore and try and iterate and explore some more and then iterate some more. It's a long, long string of failures followed by one success. It's the product that ends up going to the market. 
it's so the product how many that ends up getting failures, tools. How many failures do you think you need before you get to a successful one? It, it all depends. I mean, there are some designs where I've sat down, like drop cam. I did that drop cam Nest series camera for sketch almost. Um, and it was, but tried a whole bunch of others around it. Um, th but typically you might go through, as I mentioned before, you know, hundreds of sketches and sometimes you make models. Many of them aren't going to work. You try it, but you have this relationship with failure. Like it's your friend because you're going to learn from it. And there's, I mean, that's, that's the proverbial, like, you know, learning from your f failures. I mean, you have to live with this all day long as a designer, but you don't look at them as failures. You just look at them as like, again, maybe trials and errors and, you know, a necessary thing you go through during your exploration where you're kind of getting it out of your system. And um, yeah, so that's the most important thing to look at. And so as far as like, failures actual good examples of that well um, i'm more interested in the failures where you were absolutely convinced that this was going to work and somehow it didn't and then obviously the biggest learning lessons come from those yeah really here's a really good a really good example is we were working with cisco systems about i don't know maybe this was like eight years ago and they had the technology to provide telepresence which is kind of what we're doing right now, except very advanced telepresence. They, they, were, they pulled it off in the business world where you sit at a table and across from you is a big 60 inch television where you see the other person that you're having a teleconference with full scale. It's almost like wow. someone is sitting across the table. That's telepresence. Cool. So we did their telepresence system for them, for business. And then we suggested going into the consumer market. So let's take some of this technology scale it down so it's more cost effective, offer it to end users where you put this device, this very advanced camera and microphone array on top of your television at home. Now you can talk to your, your family from across the world. Why wouldn't people want that, right? Sounds good. So yeah. we went off, we designed it, we engineered it, we did all the user interface for it, extraordinary solution. It, was re it worked really, really well, <clears throat> except it hit the market and nobody wanted it. Why not? Seems like the obvious. Various factors. So one is uh, they tried to sell it under a subscription plan uh, and people, it wasn't worth, I think it was like, uh, I don't know, $80 a month or something like that at the oh, time. Oh, yeah, I get that. And so people, what we didn't realize is that I think because we were, and so was Cisco, we were thinking that everybody's going to want this high definition, high audio, 5.1 stereo surround. Actually, they were okay with what we're doing right now, Zoom. And this was eight years ago. So people were doing, you know, um, you know, WebEx, early Skype, and people were wanting to use their notebooks instead. So that product was a total flop. Um, Okay, there were some marketing inadequacies. Uh, Cisco had never really done any kind of consumer marketing before. So that was, you know, one of the reasons for its failure. But you know what? We, we thought it was going to be a win too. So we, we built in all the features that we felt were going to make it successful, but, but we were wrong also. So yeah, I guess, you know, there was learning from that. Um, what did you learn from that? What were the practicalities that you knew not to do anymore afterwards. I, I think, and this would be not only this project, but it's a collective learning tells you that even though that technology is there and it's available, the high def, the high audio, the high streaming bandwidth, you know, all this cool stuff that technology can do, you have to constantly ask yourself, do people want this? Are we doing the right thing? Is this the right combination? Does this have value to the end user? Maybe we don't give them all that. Maybe we don't need all those features. Maybe it can be more primitive than this because it's not the technology often that makes the experience enjoyable. It's, it's these intangible human qualities. It's, it's tactility. It's, it's uh, maybe a fun little animation or a motion graphic in a user interface that makes people connect with the offering. 
It's sometimes these little things that make a difference. Um, and I, so it forces you as a designer to understand that sometimes even though the technology is right there out front and presented to you as a design opportunity and you want to jump on it, trust me, we are shown so much cool technology. And as a designer, you're like, man, we're going to showcase every bit of that technology. We're going to celebrate it. We're going to push it. We're going to give it such a cool design that people just eat it up. Sometimes you have to take that technology and put it in the back seat. Yes, it can influence you as the driver, but keep your eyes on the road. Realize you have this steering wheel in front of you that is somewhat primitive. And as a designer, you first have to understand, okay, what do people really want? And you have to be super honest with yourself. And if you're not sure what they want, by golly, get out there and ask them. Work with consumers. Make a bunch of prototypes. Try it out. What do you Make mean go out sure. there and ask them? Where do you go? There's all kinds of means of doing all kinds of research. Talk to focus groups. You can do online research. There's all kinds of qualitative research. Most of it's qualitative that we do. Okay. We're actually out there testing ideas, trying to qualify. Do people respond to this particular detail? Do they want that feature? What's missing? What are they worried about? Um, what are they really looking for? What is the nature of the pain point? And it's easy as a designer to convince yourself Oh, I know what the pain point is because I've had that problem before. You need to get in the back seat as a designer and, and give the wheel to the consumer. Watch what they're doing. Again, listen to what, they're, what their concerns are. Look at as much evidence as you can. Again, the end user is one of your informants. Like I talked about before, there are a lot of different informants in design. It's, you know, in addition to the end user, there's like, you know, technological capability. Can it really do this? Can that really be wireless? Can it? Can this really float? Uh, those are all informants. Um, maybe something like this has been produced in the past and completely, utterly failed. That's an informant. Go find out. Well, what is it? What is it? Why did that fail before? It shouldn't have failed. On the books, it shouldn't have failed. Go find out. Do you have an again, example of something like on the books, it should not have failed, but it failed, and then you guys had to design a product and, and you fixed it. So somewhere else it failed, like m maybe that Brita uh, example was one where you researched it and in the past somebody else did it, but it failed. And then you guys had a crack at it, at it and it, it went well. There are, um, well one is Brita was already hugely successful with filtered water. And uh, so we were, only a part of this journey to make it even better. Uh, but there were indeed a lot of little problems that we discovered. And are there other stories maybe? Not oh my people. goodness, there's so many different stories of, um, I mean, every project that we've ever worked on has conditions that could be better. You know, I remember doing a uh, a baby bottle for Adiri. And a baby bottle for a what? Uh, this company called Adiri. Oh, okay. And, you know, I'm thinking, and they came in, they said, we want to create the ultimate baby bottle. And we didn't know anything about baby bottles, right? We, we hadn't done one before. And we started looking in the industry and realized, my gosh, why do they pretty much all look alike? There's this kind of nipple that's being held down by a ring yeah. onto the main bottle. We found out that was originally patented in 1906. We're thinking, oh my God, that was over 100 years ago. I didn't Same know. thing is being done. Different materials, yes. And then we found out they were they were using BPA in the polycarbonate. So this oh, is a no. kind of an estrogen um, in, yeah, it's a replicator. It's a, yeah, and it can be dangerous. Not, but it, it can have long-term health effects. I think it can elevate estrogen levels to the point where yes. it can mess up your hormones, especially you got in babies. It. I had no idea that it was in those bottles. Yes, it was in almost every plastic baby bottle. So uh, then we realized, well, why are babies getting colic? Well, we found out that a lot of the baby bottles were allowing the baby, because they didn't breathe right, they were allowing bubbles to be ingested with the milk as they were feeding from the bottle. 
And because the, the esophageal valve is not fully developed when you're, when you're a newborn, it doesn't open properly to let you burp. So that causes a lot of pressure in the stomach, which causes pain, which causes colic, crying. So again, we didn't really know that. Um, and then we looked at like, what is the dynamic? What's actually going on inside the baby's mouth when they're breastfeeding versus traditional bottles? Um, how are those bottles venting? Because of course, when you're breastfeeding, there's no air behind the milk. The breast is changing with the pressure as milk is being uh, taken out from the baby. So you start looking into the, the dynamics of the operational model, really, which is what that is. And then you begin to craft like solutions to each one of these problems and hopefully pull, hopefully you're, you're aiming to pull it all together into this synchronous solution where all of these problems are solved and working. Um, so, you know, throughout that process, we made many prototypes, put them in front of babies, and these babies were very honest about the way that they liked or didn't <laughs> like the products. So I remember this one toddler, she was maybe a year old, I handed her one of the prototypes. She wasn't even speaking yet. And she put it up to her mouth. She didn't like it. She threw it at me. The bottle hit me in the forehead. <laughs> now, talk about getting information back from the end user. <laughs> you know, True. that was pretty clear. Yeah. Um, I, you know, and I remember, I love working with kids too. I remember doing, doing the uh, Logitech Kids Mouse years ago. And I had the cord coming out of the front of this mouse shape that created this mouse. And the kids looked at that and because the cord comes out the front of a mouse, right? Yeah. And kids looked at it and they said, ooh, that mouse is sucking spaghetti. And then I looked at it and I'm like, oh my God, it actually is. So the cord had to become the tail. So we exited the cord out of the back of that mouse and we brought it around the side of the mouse, a little clip. And bam, it became a huge hit, right? Because now it was like, how cute. It was the first kid's mouse produced for Logitech. Um, big hit product. But anyway, back to the, uh, the British story. Um, you, you know, you go through a lot of these testing, the prototypes, again, coming back to this esteem method that I mentioned before, where you do a lot of the, the examination, the seeing, the thinking, the exploration, wide exploration. I'm a big believer in that. And then you do the evaluation. You're constantly stepping back, testing, evaluating, trying out, making sure your assumptions indeed made sense, because a lot of times you're wrong. And then finally you make it. And making it is either making prototypes or manufacturing it. And you get it into the hands of the end users. And they'll ultimately tell you if your design is right or not. They don't care about you. As a designer, they could care less about you. They're not trying to make you happy. They're not trying to make the brand happy either. They're just going to either like it or not and buy it or not. And what you're trying to do as a designer is you, you, you're, you're looking into the future and you are taking your best guess about what somebody is going to want to purchase maybe two years from now. You, you're having to imagine a desired percept. You want, you want a user to think and feel, have some kind of proximal uh, stimulus that tells them, this is something good. My perception on this is, is positive. But you need to predict this way in the future. So designers are fu futurists because of that. We're constantly living in the future. You can't, you can't just fall in love with this thing you're creating right now because it might not be relevant in a few years. Right. And we're, we're trying to move our clients along pretty quick because sometimes this technology especially goes obsolete. So you got to get it out there quick. And you also, you also know that there's probably some other designers and engineers and corporations that are right on your tail or doing the same thing in a parallel universe, and they're going to hit the market maybe before you. So you have to be a little bit on the edge of your seat all the time when you're developing products too. What I, what I like about your stories, um, I, I love your stories. You're telling them and just, it, I know these products. It, I, the process behind it is so interesting. My, my first question that pops up every time you tell these stories is, you have this ability to create something from nothing, and then you have the engine engineering kind of capabilities to actually make it. How come you've never wanted to just create a product and, and just make that product yours? So um, many of the products that I have worked on or designed with companies 
were indeed actually uh, part owned by Whipsaw and me. Oh, um, so, so you have, uh, in that sense, some kind of co-foundership status exactly, or something. Exactly. And we'll often take equity in the companies we work with, especially when we see something that we, an opportunity that looks especially exciting and uh, promising in the market. We're like, yeah, sure, this is, uh, this is cool. We want to be a part of it. And our clients will gladly, usually, gladly, unless they're public, <laughs> Uh, provide us with with shares in the company because they want us to be invested. They want our mind share. You know, they want us to to be thinking about their problem at five o'clock in the morning when you're in this twilight zone of creativity and you're you're addressing their problem. They want you to be engaged, and it's a good way to do it. I must say, to be a part of these successes is really cool. Um, we had this lunchbox called Yubo that was on Shark Tank. And there were three founders. I was one of the three. And as so a husband you were on Shark Tank. Yeah. Uh -huh, funny. So but it was it was a company that I am one of the three owners, but the husband and wife made a very cute couple with their daughters and they went on to Shark Tank and uh, presented this. They got they were they were liked by four out of the five. You know, the product was a total hit. It's still on the market as a Ubo lunchbox. It's really cool. Um, but I liked being the silent partner. And they actually, in the Shark Tank episode, they talked about me and, and the fact that um, they considered me to this couple to be kind of like... A, an external financial liability <laughs> because there's a, a royalty being paid in perpetuity, in other words, forever on it. And I just thought I got a kick out of that because it's just like, you know, and then they cut to a commercial. They always look for that tension moment. I was the tension mm -hmm. moment. And um, I thought that was cool. I have so many stories because, you know, as a consultant, I get to work with some incredible, brilliant people from all around the world. I've worked with very famous people to help them with telling their product story. At the end of the day, you know, products that you create, they, they are telling a story about the people that are behind them, the brands, the people, the promise. What um, are some of the most inspiring people or like uh, founders that you've worked with? That, that really left an impact on well, you? Well, everybody wants to know about my experience working with Steve Jobs. Um, yeah, what was it with Steve Jobs, for instance? Uh, well, you know what's cool about Steve Jobs? Because you, wor you worked with Steve on, uh, on the next computers, right? Yes, right. Somehow, for some reason, the universe put Steve into my life several times in my life. I remember when I was 19 years, when I was 20 years old, I was working as an intern at Hewlett Packard. I went to a the Stanford Design Conference, and the keynote speaker was Steve Jobs. And Apple had just gone public. And I came outside at lunch, and I was with my buddies, students. These were other student interns at HP. I remember Steve Jobs walking out of the auditorium with his lunch tray in his hand, looking around at all of the people in the conference. We're talking 300 people. And he chooses us to come and sit and have lunch with. He comes around. You know, all those little funny stories you hear about him are true. So he kicks off his shoes right away. <laughs> he had dirty <laughs> jeans on. And he sat down and talked to us. There were five people in our group. And we just asked him a few questions. Otherwise, it was just enough to set him off. And he was going telling stories about technology. And I was... Wait, how old was he at this point? And how old were you? I was 20. He was uh, 35. Yeah. Okay. Um, or maybe even 30. You know, gosh, um, he actually died on my birthday. Uh, so again, that was another one of these strange confluences. Uh, so then years go by and I joined Frog Design. I, had, I knew that Frog Design had done all this Apple work working with Steve Jobs, but when Scully kicked out Steve Jobs, he asked Frog, do you want to come with me or do you want to stick with this, this guy Scully? So Frog Design, Hartman Esslinger, my boss, the founder of, of Frog Design, chose working with Steve Jobs. And so when I got to Frog, one of my first projects was, or an assignments was to work on the next computer with Steve. And of course, he was very involved in the design process. He, uh, so then when I went in there, 
I'm like, hey, it was good to meet you again. Because, you know, many years prior, that was seven years. No, it was like nine years went by. I'm like, I actually met you at the Stanford Design Conference. It's really great to meet you again. And he, he just looked at me. He didn't know who, he, who I was. He just looked at me and he just said, ditto. It was really kind of unfriendly. I'm like, oh, <laughs> that was kind of icy. Okay. I'm like, all right, this is what I'm dealing with. And then we all sat around a big table with his team, his marketing and engineering team, and he, he berated everybody in the room. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, he's going to tear me up one day. So I, I was honestly a little bit nervous. You know, I was always, always had butterflies when I had to go over there and present to him. Turned out that what we, does what does berate like Steve Jobs berating everybody talks about this, but what does he then actually say? Is he just to the point and straight and saying, "Hey, this sucks. We need to fix it," or is he actually like, what, what is happening in that room? What's happening? Okay, so you know that that very first meeting that I had, there were literally twenty people in the room, and. Somebody made a marketing. We're going to go in this direction. We're going to we're going to make the keyboard uh, with these kind of features. We want to do this. We want to develop it. This is the market. Steve would be like, "Why? What are you talking about? You don't know anything about that market. Prove to me you know what that market is." No, I disagree. I totally disagree. You don't know what the f you're doing. I'm like, oh my god. You know, I'm from Ohio, right? You don't talk to people like that. I had never never seen anything like this in my life. The way that he was treating people. Now, the weird thing was, because I was a designer, I was already kind of clued into what he, what he meant. I knew he had a vision for his products, and I'll be darned, but he was right. It's just his methods were, back then at least, were pretty harsh. I think he, he got around that over time. You know, by the time he rejoined Apple and got that righted again, I think he, he chilled out quite a bit. But man, he was he was tough. He was tough on his engineers, tough on his marketing folks. Um, I'll never forget we were in a smaller meeting and he walks in. This is maybe a month after. Uh, no, several months after that first meeting, and I had been working with him. And generally, he was nice to me, but he was never like uh, overly friendly. He wasn't the kind of guy that had any small talk. You know, he'd be like, if you said, "Hey, how are you?" He'd be like, a grunt. And he walked into this room and he looked at me and my boss, Hartman Esslinger, and he said, who designed that AT&T answering machine? Now, this is a project that I had just done and finished and it was announced. And it was a first digital answering machine for AT&T, my first project at Frog. And he asked that question, who designed that AT&T answering machine? And then he looked, he looked over the top of his glasses like this at me. I said, I did, thinking he is going to tear me up. He hates it. Here, this is finally Dan's turn to be berated by Steve Jobs. <laughs> and he looked over the top of his glasses like this, totally intimidating. It's great. Just like that. Long time. That felt like 10 minutes to me. Because I thought, I'm going to get it. Here it comes. Sure as, sure as the sun's going to come out tomorrow morning. What was cool about that moment was, one, it was a big relief, obviously. But I sort of won his trust at that moment. So that every subsequent meeting that I had with him, he gave me a chance to say my piece about what we were trying to do with the design. And I always reminded myself, yes, as brilliant as you are, Mr. Jobs, uh, you're often not a very nice person. You're, you're, yes, you're brilliant. And yes, you will call out certain things in, in my design propositions to you that need improvement. But at the end of the day, I'm the better designer. And I'm going to help you. So I learned to work with him. Um, and so anyway, that was a, an awesome experience working with him. I, he was... Not the mythical character quite yet that he did become after he came back after he did come back to Apple. But then, uh, if but he if he wasn't that mythical character, I guess I read the the book from Bob Iger, the CEO of Disney, where um, 
in one passage, he describes calling Steve Jobs as so intimidating because he was calling somebody who changed the world. And I always imagined um, if he was so strict in his methods, people probably tolerated that because they believed that he, you know, could change the world. Yes. But then in this phase, obviously, he's not that mythical creature yet, like everybody says. But why did people then tolerate that? Because he was so insightful. He was very smart. He did call out these truths that other people did not or weren't brave enough to. His methods were abrasive. He was prickly. Um, he was odd. But you were definitely aware of his intellectual presence when you were in a room. He, he filled up the room. And he, he was so good at the details. I was really impressed with him. You know, I remember turning a model around. He's like, show me the connector field in the back. And I turned it around. He goes, you're having trouble the way that that surface comes up and makes a transition onto the top plane of the back of this computer, aren't you? I'm like, um, actually, yes. Um, I haven't quite gotten to that yet, Steve, but uh, you can be sure that by next Friday at three o'clock, that'll be taken care of. And he's like, good. Next. <laughs> you know, wow. that's so those kind details. Of, oh my God, he knew the details. And that's why I respected him so much. And I, I speak very positively about him where others don't, because I think if you were a, like, especially like a marketing person or an executive that had a different vision than him, he would really test you. But as a designer or an engineer, you know, we love a guy like that, a client like that, because he, he'd get right in there with you. He'd swim around in those details with you all day long if you let him. Um, and he understood it and he respected it too. He, I think he wanted to be a designer in a way. You know, he always, there's that special thing. He gave us a pass card. He gave designers pass cards. That's why Apple's done so well. I think he was able to form relationships with these designers. They respected him in turn. And it, it just, yeah, I think the world of design, we miss a guy like that. I know I do. He was just, um, it, to me, he was a light. And I love that. That's why, you know, he's been replaced by somebody like Elon Musk. You know, I love how brave he is. He's brash and brave in a kind of a similar way. He cuts through all the crap and uh, just wants to innovate. He doesn't let anybody say the word impossible. He doesn't let anyone doubt him. Doesn't care that much, again, what people think of him. He says ridiculous things, but he goes for it. You just, at the end of the day, you really just have to go for it. You know, build a set of maxims or principles that you as an individual will have within your field, like, like what I would have typically uh, that, that, that drives me are things, you know, like be audacious in your solutions all the time. I like to say if, if the wind doesn't blow, the grass doesn't stir. It's an old Chinese proverb and it's self-explanatory, but you know, you've got to take chances. You have to be brave to get the innovation to really be, again, transcendent, to do something that the world has never seen before. Um, to be brave enough to try weird things. People like Steve Jobs, he understood that. Man, he was, you know, he would try the strangest things, but it was always from a core, again, you know, what I was talking about informants. He, he had his informants too. Something told him that he wanted to bring culture into the experience of a com personal computer, for example. So he focused on things like typography and layout and color and he wanted his products, the physical products, to be designed with so much beauty and tactility and materiality. I mean, if you think back even 12 years ago, if you were to tell me that a notebook computer like the one I'm sitting in front of would be made from a block of machined aluminum, I'd be like, no, you're crazy. That is not possible. Why? It's so, well, one is it's insanely expensive. What Apple did, Steve said, nope. And his designers probably convinced him too. Yep, we're going to make this out of pure aluminum. So what does he do? He, he has the, Apple has the biggest collection of CNC machines in the world. Their factories have lines and lines and lines and lines. So they were able to economize it to a point where CNC machining is actually feasible in mass production. 
and the quality is so high and they convinced consumers that that this level of materiality was so good that they were able to command a higher price point. So that was, again, design speaking, design elevating the material to a position where you can now demand a higher cost. He understood that. He understood that, that people want quality. They want goodness. They will pay for it, but by golly, you better deliver on it. I opened up this packet this morning because I haven't had wired earbuds in a long time. I opened it up this morning for this talk. The way that I was studying the way that the little paper holder, the way that the cord is wound and the earbuds themselves are placed in these cavities, the way it's positioned, the way they folded the material, designers and engineers worked on that likely for six months, I would say, to perfect it. And they made probably 100 prototypes. They worked with their factory to produce that. And we're talking about just the thing that holds the earbuds, not the earbuds themselves. That's a whole different massive undertaking. He understood that that matters to people. Stuff like that matters. How you brand things. How you tell your story. Tell it with guts. His advertising campaigns. The fact that you could, you could just see the edge you go down the highway and just see a giant billboard. It's just the edge of the iPhone. That's it. It's just a reflection as it comes around the corner with this beautiful moon-shaped screen in multicolors. And it just says iPhone in the bottom right. That's all you need. We have the capacity as humans to absorb all of that quality within a nanosecond. You take most ad agencies, most storytellers, oh no, you need to put the features up there. You need to tell them how fast that phone is, how much memory it has, how much better it is than the Google phones, um, how cheap it is. You know, it's, no, no, you don't need all that. No, appeal, appeal, appeal. I love that. Um, so you actually transitioned from frog design to, to setting up your, your own thing I guess the question is, I was researching that and I saw it and my question was why? You were president of Frog <laughs> Design at one point and Frog Design, like you said, works with Apple and does all that cool stuff. So so why? And like, um, what was happening in your mind to make that transition? Everything changes, including companies, people, conditions. I had been, I came in as a senior designer and quickly became creative director, VP, and then ultimately president. And I loved my job at Frog. It was, it, I learned so much there. It was, the, it was the pivotal decade that allowed me to just, one, have the, have the background, the experience, and the confidence to start my own firm. But I'm always, I've always been pretty ambitious, so I kind of felt like, you know, here I was, I was 39 years old, at Frog, and I'm like, okay, do I stay here for the rest of my career? Um, I, and things change, you know, the dynamics and the leadership in the company changed, and I wasn't seeing eye to eye anymore. Um, I, it was also a pivotal time in that company's history where they were moving a little bit more away from industrial design, more into what we called back then new media, which is UX and UI. So they were doing a lot more digital work. And I was interested in that, but I didn't want to move the whole business model to that. Um, so I think it was a combination of these factors where, you know, I wasn't really seeing eye to eye anymore with my co-leaders at the company. And um, I think I, it was like time. It was like, if I'm ever going to do anything else, what, I, where could I go? I like, could I go to IDEO, maybe be a VP in some corporation and do that the rest of my life? Um, I, I was uh, headhunted to join Apple, and um, I declined it. Well, at the why time. did you decline it? And weren't you scared to do something on your own? No, I wasn't very scared to be honest. Um, and again, I think it came back to the security and confidence that I was able to glean from my childhood years. Just like you know, I think again. You know, my parents are always like, well, you, you have this gift. It's your responsibility to actualize on it. Just, you know, go for it. I had enough contacts from Frog 
and I had enough experience. I believed in myself and I believed in people that I knew would come with me. And I was just ready and super excited. I never doubted myself. I never was really afraid. I mean, sure, there are times when you're, you're anxious about, am I going to make payroll this month? And do we have enough clients? Um, do we have enough insurance? Um, is our attorney telling us the truth? Do we have the right accountant? You know, there's these kinds of things. <laughs> but as a designer, I never doubted it. You know, it was just a matter of like, okay, it's the next part of my life. I knew I needed to do it. And uh, it was very liberating for me to do it. And it was, I remember being set free. It was like coming out of an, a, a manhole and realizing, oh my God, there's another horizon here. <laughs> it's, I can do whatever I want. I was literally floating for like six months. I was floating on air. And many companies called me from my past, um, some of whom were frog design clients, uh, some were I've known a long time. And they were like, well, of course they want to use you. Of course, we've been waiting for you to do this. So I, it was no problem getting work. I mean, the first week I had Cisco, the second week Creative Labs, third week a cool division of General Dynamics. Um, and it was just a matter of just, yeah, just, just doing it. Um, do you recommend new entrepreneurs to go through the experience first and then eventually later in life switching to entrepreneurship, um, really discovering who they are like you did and then kind of with more confidence stepping into that or, or looking back now, having hindsight, would you I've recommend I've seen, else? I've seen both things work. I've seen and we work with some very, very young people that like popped out of college and they've got a little startup because they've always had an interest in this one thing. It might be like a sporting product. You know, maybe they've skied their whole life and they've got this idea on a brand new ski boot. That's entering um, a business as an entrepreneur with a lot of inspiration. That works. Sometimes that works. For design consulting, it was my opinion after working for several different consulting firms, like, oh my God, I've got a lot to learn about a lot of stuff. How can I learn to speak the language of marketing? How can I learn to speak the language of engineering? How can I be brave enough to walk up to a CEO and tell him or her they should go in this direction? How can I build that confidence? I needed to learn all that. How do I write a proposal? You come out of design school, you don't write proposals in design school. You don't, you don't get any business learning when you're in design school. I had to learn that and I became very fascinated with the business of design. It doesn't drive me. It influences me in, on the structure of the company. What drives me is the promise of design and creativity. But you have to work within the realm and the framework of a business environment. You need to learn that. I felt that I, I needed to learn from the very best. So I always sought to work for, before founding my own firm, the very best firm possible. That's why my very first internship, when I was 19 years old, I went up to Columbus, Ohio to work for Richardson Smith. They were the best design firm in the United States at the time. It How was an epiphany. How did you get that internship? You know, I, I was the least likely to get it because um, they, I remember my, prof remember I was this, I was kind of a hippie, right? So like um, I wore clogs, torn jeans, my hair was halfway down my back in design school and I was the renegade in the class. So I told a teacher that I didn't, I remember the, the placement teacher saying, okay, you have to, Dan, you have to go out to this one corporation out somewhere in Ohio that um, makes boat hauls. And I'm like, okay, I have no interest in fiberglass and boat hauls, so I'm not gonna go. He's like, what do you mean you're not going to go? You haven't had one internship. Who are you to tell me you're not going to go? I'm like, well, I don't want to do it. I said, I'll get my own darn job. So he's like, okay, buddy, you're on your own from now on for the next five years of design school. You're supposed to use your placement officer to help you get jobs. So I'm like, fine. So this whole truckload of interns went up to Richardson Smith to intern. They all got in line. They went through their interviews. There were like, I don't know, like almost 20, 20 that wanted that job. I called Richard and Smith on the side. I said, hey, I'm not part of the bus tour, but I want to come up the week after. I'll drive up on my own and talk to you guys. So, so I arrived. The power was out. There was a huge storm. So they were taking my little 35 millimeter slides out of the tray and looking with a flashlight. I'll never forget that. 
They're saying, oh my God, you did this? And they're dropping my slides on the floor. I thought it was a complete and utter disaster. So I just was joking with them and like, okay, I'm not going to get this job for sure. <laughs> so <laughs> turns out they selected me and that set my career off because I was, the reason I say that was the epiphany because that was like this hot, cool design firm that had all these different clients doing consumer products. They had Texas Instruments. They had NCR, like early computers. That was my first exposure to really cool technology. They had amazing people. Dean Richardson, the founder, and Ed Long, the VP of design, and a whole bunch of other people that really, really inspired me. And I was just sucking it all up, you know, working 14-hour days just because I couldn't get enough of it. And that leads to your next job. Then I got the, you know, I got out the phone page, the yellow book, because I wanted to work for the great master George Nelson in New York City. He had created all this great work for Herman Miller. He was like the master. And he was like, he was like my Yoda. He was this older gentleman, kind of quiet, gruff. He was just like Yoda. <laughs> he kind of looked like Yoda, come to think of it. <laughs> but I learned so much from him. Not because he was so open. I had to actually get him in private moments. We always met in this public bathroom that overlooked Gramercy Park. And that's where he taught me lessons because he was smoking cigarettes at that window every day. And I would go there and ask him questions. Just, just again, sucking it all up. What did I have to tell him? Nothing. I would just ask him a question. He'd go off on design. And I'd just take it all in. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah, it's interesting. I use that knowledge even today. And then, you know, worked at Dreyfus because I wanted to know the business of design. They had AT&T, Polaroid, John Deere. They had these amazing American Airlines, you know, one amazing client after the other. And I learned how to do this work of design in a consulting firm. And I was then ready for the best design firm in the world. And there was only one, in my opinion, that was Frog Design. Yes, they were doing work for Apple. I saw that first Apple IIc and I was blown away. I'm like, wow, this is so beautiful. It's such a great direction for the future of technology. They did this flat screen television for Sony, the Sony Trinitron. They had attitude, they had moxie, they were crazy. Some people said, no, no, don't, don't talk to Frog. They're, they're out, they're crazy. They need, they need psychological help, they're so weird. Like, yeah, that's the kind of people I wanna work with. So yeah, that, that led me to get on a plane and go to California and uh, get that conversation going. And you know, you, I can't say I had some big grand plan about building a, a career. I just knew that I wanted to be inspired by good people around me and I wanted to have environments where I could fully express myself. I felt I had a lot to give. I felt it inside myself like, okay, I'm not a great designer yet, but I know I have it in me. I need a place where I can let it out and I'm going to be listened to, trusted and be inspired by. It. And so that's what I sought after. I would recommend that to anyone, everyone. Don't settle for the big bucks when you're young, just, you know, just go get to a place where you are going to be inspired, you're going to learn, you're going to grow, you're going to become who you are meant to become. And sometimes you don't know, you can't strategize that. You have to take it one step at a time. And sometimes you take one step up on the ladder, sometimes you have to, you go back a step. But sometimes you get to jump to the very, very top of the rung quick, because suddenly you have this, this new way of viewing your world and you within that world and you form a reality that allows you to now use all of your faculties to self-actualize and that's the moment where you know and this, this happens throughout your career where you suddenly you're like oh shoot i okay i've reached that level of understanding and it's not about accomplishment it's not about winning all the awards and patents all that's all fine and good it's more what happens to you internally with your understanding of the world and people and like how to do certain things and how to bring forth a vision that you might feel, but transfer that vision into reality. That's, that's the big leap, the big synapse that has to occur when you're a creative person is taking these dreams and notions and then all of a sudden making this gigantic leap across a chasm where you can't believe you can even jump that far to make it real. And when it becomes real, it's sometimes even a, 
the shock when you're like, wow, people actually really love that thing that I thought about two years ago. Oh yeah, I remember working on that. <laughs> you know, because mm -hmm. when you're churning a, as a consultant, you're churning through a lot of projects. You look back and you're like, oh yeah, I remember being in that state of mind where I had to think about how somebody's going to interact with something. And here it is, that, that final, the final landing on the other side of that chasm is that moment that that end user takes in, absorbs, and enjoys what you have given them. And, that's what, and I do see it as a giving. It's a giving. Design is a lot about giving. Yeah. What I love about your story, especially because we actually went into your childhood and your parents, is um, you going to Frog Design and also you going for the best design firms. It sounds almost like your, your mom who created such a safe environment for you to be safe and heard and and confident that when you exited into the world you just you wanted to be in those environments not being afraid that you totally. weren't good enough like a lot of us totally totally don't even let that enter your mind who gives an s what other people think quite frankly it is your reality it's your life it's your world you know. I have two. I have two questions about that. What are like? Uh, so, what was the what was the exact background of your mom? So, what kind of psychologist was she? What were the key things that she did that maybe if somebody has children can do for them? Um, and then later on, I'll ask you the question: How did you actually get to frog design? Because I want to actually hear the nitty gritty of that sure. story. Uh, but, general psychology, and. She had immense patience. I'm a byproduct of both of my parents. My mom was very quiet and patient and intellectual. Uh, my father was the opposite. No, he was also intellectual, but he was exuberant and um, affable. He made, made friends with everybody. He could talk to strangers and, and that stranger would think that, that he was their best friend. <laughs> um, and he had guts. You know, he was amazing at sales and biz dev. And to watch him work, I was like amazed when I was like 10 years old. And I remember me and my brother making candlesticks and we sold them door to door. And my dad was like, hey, you know, you're going to learn how to work with people. I'm like, yeah, dad, we don't want to go knock on somebody's door and sell them the candlesticks that we made. What? Who's going to want these things? He's like, you'll see. <laughs> you guys are both cute. Get out there and you'll sell them. Sure enough, I could sell like six candlesticks in one go and I'd make like 40 bucks as a kid. You know, when you're eight or nine years old, oh, that's like amazing, right? So he inspired me too. My mom would always have this, this quiet way about her, never being judgmental, never saying no to how I wanted to express myself. Uh, when I would do a drawing, she would listen to what I was trying to do. She would get excited about it. Um, always, always being supportive, never cutting you down. Too many parents cut their kids down and that, uh, that takes the creativity right out of you. I mean, quite frankly, a lot of schools do this. You know, you're supposed to sort of get in line and, and memorize a lot of stuff. Um, schools nowadays, a lot about rote memorization. By the time you get through high school, you're already kind of taught that oh, maybe creativity is not as valued as being good at math or English or uh, being in AP courses. You've got to be a bit of a renegade. You have to be driven to keep that side of your mind alive by the time you get through school. I just, um, I, I think partly because, mainly because of my parents, um, I didn't, I didn't have this self-doubt and I and I always felt like okay no this this creative side is my anchor uh, even if I get a B or a C on my math test that's okay Dan I've got this other thing that people don't have other people don't have and it's special and I can't wait to show the world how special I am in this everybody will have this little special thing within them it needs to be nurtured. It needs to be protected. Sometimes it needs flying buttresses, you know, because it's fragile. It's very fragile. You can tell a kid, you can tell a teenager, 
Oh no, you shouldn't be a musician. My gosh, you listen to your voice. You're such a weak soprano. Bam, all of a sudden, it all comes down because you had no buttresses. And you'll never, and then you're, because it's creativity is so personal, if you are attacked like that, and it can be very fragile, it might not sound on the surface like an attack, but to a creative person, there are many of whom are very sensitive, it, it can demolish your self-esteem. It can destroy your future. And it's, so I think a lot of people that could have been creative end up being attorneys or um, accountants or maybe even doctors. And, you know, doctors are pretty much following a formula. I mean, there's some amazing doctors that are super creative, but generally speaking, you are following formulas, right? Things that have worked in the past, you just do it again on I mean, different people. I was literally studying law and then I started living alone. And um, mm -hmm. I remember graduating um, while well, getting into my second or third year um, living on my own and just like finally starting to open up what is possible and realizing that I'm more creative than I am. Yeah, and just ending up in this yeah. filmmaking career and it's just everything which you're describing is so true right See, now. See, you found it. You found it. So many people... But had it not been the release of not um, being completely free and away from from any influence from my parents, I don't think it would have happened. So it's really interesting to yeah. see how the environment was created for you that you didn't even have to go away from your parents, but you could already be creative with them. Obviously, you yes. did blow up some stuff in the process, <laughs> but <laughs> still interesting. Yeah, yeah I, I, I was fortunate in that way. But everyone has a different journey on how to get there to find themselves. And you just have to have a little bit of courage to go find it, even if, and don't settle, don't settle. I always feel like some of my, some of my design peers, even they kind of settled by maybe going to a corporation because, well, it's, you know, it's time to raise a family and I need that steady income. And so I'm just going to go design this one small series of products for the rest of my career even though I know within them they want to do so much more. They have so much more to give as designers. Um, yeah, having the, the courage and the self-confidence, that certainly helps. And then just try it. Just people, uh, so much of our world has become formulaic and so much is given to us through media, through this media, through television, that so many people, I think, get, get discouraged that well, what's left for me, or I should fall in line or do what other people have done because there are some good examples there. But the, tr the real truth and the real promise of who you are is really already residing within you. It's just a matter of, again, kind of removing this, this impermeable barrier to who you really are, your subconscious, to release it and do whatever you have to to, to like, get there you know maybe just I don't, we're all we're all very different you know all I can say is I just had to just do it just by the act of doing art and design and tinkering and making and taking things apart that's how I that was my entry point that was my funnel into who I became and then when I popped out of the bottom of that funnel there I am yeah what um uh... Before we are like going into the close off and everything, I really, really want to go back to what you said about frog, like frog design. That was the best. I wanted to go there. So then you bought a plane ticket and you just went there or what happened? I called, them on just... the, I called him up on the phone and I, I told him who I was and I had met the founder of frog design when I was in Germany after I graduated from college I had the opportunity to go work for the consulting firms and HP that I mentioned after graduating they all pretty much made me an offer some were serious offers and, and others I never even got to writing because I told them no I was always inspired by European design as I was in design school. I was inspired by these architects 
in Europe, I was inspired by industrial designers like Mario Bellini and Ettore Satsas. They were doing all this work for Olivetti, these beautiful typewriters and computers and phones, really, really neat stuff. And I was like, how are they doing this? What are they doing? So I actually got a one-way ticket to Europe in 1982, and I had my portfolio on my back, and I literally, I remember um, going to a design museum and writing down the designers that I liked, and then I got a phone book, and I went to a payphone, and I started calling the design firms that I liked. And I did get a job in southern Germany with a really neat little firm. We were doing um, parts for Mercedes-Benz and BMW. And during my employment there, which was only about a year. Is this a paid employment? Yeah, you're... of course. Yeah, it was right out of college. And here I was working as kind of like an illegal immigrant in Germany. Right. Trying to learn German. That was tough. Uh, didn't speak a word of it. But during that time when I was there, I visited this firm that people told me there were these crazy guys down in the Black Forest that are designing really outrageous things like roller skates and computers and uh, early, these are early computers, um, bathtubs, water faucets, furniture, you name it. And I'm like, Black Forest? Crazy guys in a Black Forest? That sounds pretty cool. So I just went down <laughs> on and I took a bus down to Frog Design. They were called Esslinger Design at the time. And I just had an informational interview. And during that interview, um, it went really well. And they're like, we, we are thinking about opening up a California office because we just met this guy. Oh, named... Frog Design is German. Yes. I had yes. no idea. And because it, Frog Design is, is from the Black Forest and there are a lot of frogs down in that part of the Black Forest. So hence Frog Design. And so they told me during that first interview in 1982, we just met this guy named Steve Jobs and he's a total nut and we're trying to win that account for the, his company called Apple. And I'm like, well, I met that guy, Steve Jobs, because I was just at a, the Stanford Design Conference like two years ago. And he's a pretty cool guy. So yeah, I recommend going after them. So we laughed about it and um, then, you know, I completed my job in Germany, but I missed the United States. And that's when I wanted to come back to New York City. That's when I got the job at Dreyfus. I ended up being there for five and a half years before joining Frog. So that was the, the circuitous route that got me there. And, uh, but sorry, what was your question though? Yeah, pretty much what you're describing, like how did you get to Frog Design? Because I, you pretty much before this story said, yeah, I just got a plane ticket and got to Frog Design, but now we're okay, getting yeah, the entire so, backstory. So then when I called Frog Design in California, after I'd seen the work that they were doing and I'd been at Dreyfus for a while, I called Frog up out of the blue, cold call, asked to talk to Hartman Esslinger, the founder. He got on the phone, Hartman, do you remember me? I, was, I came down to visit you about five years ago in the Black Forest and he's like, of course I remember you. Where have you been? He's like, can you come out soon? So I flew out. I had an interview. <laughs> uh, they looked at my portfolio. They said, can you start next week? Now, I was living in, in Brooklyn at the time. And I, I said yes. So hurriedly went back, got all my stuff, drove across the country in a little Honda Civic with all my junk in it, and started work for Frog uh, that following Monday. And it was yeah, it was like one of these moments where it's like, oh, talk about opportunity knocking. Boy, it was so loud. My my ears were ringing. It was like, I knew I had to do that. That's it was like, so interesting. And also how you got there and what you said, Steve really came multiple ways throughout your career in front of you. So it was so, so weird. There was another, uh, you know, he, I... Um, lived part-time in Palo Alto, and my house is very close to where Steve Jobs used to live. So even another occurrence that I had with him was a few years before he died, he was pulling in his parking lot, and I was, I have a hoodie on, I was on a, a cold winter walk, rather, walking very quickly, and he almost hit me. And he came flying out of his car, and I pulled my hood back, and I'm like, hey, Steve, it's me, man. And he just, he, he, he's the kind of guy where he wasn't that, flustered he's like oh sorry 
<laughs> Most people would say, oh my God, I'm so sorry. You know, what's going on? How are you? This and that. No, it was it so brief, the little conversation that we had. He almost ran me over in his Mercedes Benz. It's a, his, and then he dies on my birthday. It was just like this weird confluence of events. And I remember being in a meeting. I was working with Oracle as well, uh, working directly with Larry Ellison, the founder of Oracle. And one of his best friends, of course, is Steve Jobs. So I was presenting to Larry and he said, you know what, I'm going to have, I want you to come over for dinner. It's on a Saturday and bring all your models, bring all the design work that you've done in the last six months. Okay. So I'm late. I pull up, ring the bell outside his house. I pull up to his house. And there's a great big silver S-Class Mercedes and the license plate said Pixar. And I knew <laughs> right then, I knew right then that Steve Jobs was there. I walk in, there's only one other guy that worked at Oracle that was there. And it was, I walk in, they already started eating dinner. Steve Jobs, Larry Ellison, and then one of the guys that I was working with as well at Oracle. I'm like, oh, sorry, I'm late. <laughs> These are like the two toughest guys in the world. They never give you a break. Working with Larry, that's another story we don't have enough time for here. He was really tough. And I, after we ate, I started to present models. And of course, Steve argued about the future of technology and uh, the coming internet and um, what wireless meant and where the future of computing was going. And we all talked about that. Of course, Larry and Steve were arguing a lot, mostly with one another. Um, they were tearing apart my models, they even broke one of them and didn't say anything, didn't even bother them. They destroyed a $10,000 model right in front of my eyes um, by accident. Uh, but the cool thing was, is they were just talking about the future and Larry was saying, to Steve, you've got to go back to Apple. Now, Steve at the time, had they were just about to release Toy Story. Pixar was, so he was very involved with Pixar. Next was just about to sell to Apple. So it was, it was a turning point in his life and it was the first time that meeting, it was the first time that I saw him kind of chilled out. He was not, other than, um, arguing about the future of computing and some of the work that we were doing together with Oracle, he otherwise was a little bit more laid back. I was like, whoa, that's like a new Steve. And Larry just kept saying, oh my God, Apple's so misguided right now. You have got to go back and show them how to do this. And I, I even then I was like, I knew that I was somewhere special in the right place at the right time. It was like, I was, I had the fortune to be sitting there and the good luck to be sitting there listening to this. And I'll never forget that night. <laughs> you know, I never have forgotten it. And how interesting their relationship was. They were competitors. They were not in business necessarily, but they were both a type uh, adopted children trying to make a point um, strong, strong individuals with gigantic personalities and egos to match and to just witness these two bulls in the room going at it about what the future of technology was going to be. It was extraordinary. I remember when I left that night with, with this guy, Andy, we were like, can you believe what just happened? Can you believe we were here to witness that? It was one of the coolest meetings of my career. It was really, really extraordinary. Wow, that is, oh my God, I can talk for hours, but I have to get <laughs> to a couple of segments as we're wrapping up um, because these are important and audience requested. And obviously I don't want to take too much of your time because we've already gone really long. But um, one of the segments, which is really important considering it's impact talks, is uh, it's called the, the impact story segment. Um, and the question is, um, what is the project you worked on that had the biggest impact? Mm. Well, 
Well, being a consultant, that's hard to answer that question because we've had a whole bunch of like, well, one is producing hundreds and hundreds of products, over a thousand products to market. There's been a lot of like um, impacts in many different areas. It kind of depends on what you're, uh, I can give you some examples. Like for example, in the medical world, one of my biggest impacts was helping to invent a new surgery for a company called Silk Road Medical, which saves many lives per day. It, it does, it's an alternative to carotid artery surgery that was typically very problematic because it caused um, an embolism, um, which can make somebody have a stroke. Uh, but we were working with a team of vascular surgeons and cardiologists, we were able to conceptualize a new way to do this surgery. So that had a huge impact on the lives. Um, we've had impacts on markets. A lot of the work we've done for Google, uh, we were the first company to come in and help them with a hardware strategy that led to products like Google Home, Chromecast, uh, OnHub. These are all projects that we worked on. Um, and even unusual things for X, Google X and Google Geo, so like the Google Trekker, which is now documenting the rest of the planet where cars don't go. It's like a backpack topography and photography system, all computer processing on your back, battery power, et cetera. Cool. That's having it like an ecological impact because it's educating the world. It's, it's, it's impacting opinions about our planet because you're able to see things that you've never before been able to see when you go to Earth now. A lot of that content that's coming through is not from roads, but from like pathways. Uh, you can take this down into the subway in Tokyo if you want. Uh, you can go up to Machu Picchu with it. So that will have an impact. Um, we've had impacts with the way that we've been able to uh, look at different manufacturing processes, like uh, we developed the first 100% biodegradable label printer cartridge. It sounds like a small thing, but this printer cartridge will literally dissolve into the earth within a matter of a few months. So it's, it was a really great example of true sustainability, similar to what we did with the hub oil filter, which is a lifetime oil filter. This oil filter will last longer than your car, and it replaces the oil filters get, that get thrown away to the tune of, in this country alone, 400 million oil filters get thrown away and they're, they're already half full of oil. So it's a complete and utter ecological disaster that's happening, but nobody talks about it. But it took a lot of just hardcore thinking and problem solving to have that kind of impact. Um, we helped on other things like the Nike fuel band, uh, which ushered in this new era of wearables. You guys were behind the Nike fuel band that had the dots until it Yes, possible. yes. So there I were two companies that. that did that, Astro and Whipsaw. So Astro did the initial design, and then we started working on the project. There was a competition to make it real, and then we came in, we engineered it. Uh, we ended up redesigning quite a bit of it to make it workable. Um, and you know, 35 trips to China, lots of interesting innovation there. There's no air inside that thing at all, for example. We injection mold translucent elastomeric material directly over the circuit board and the LEDs. It's a bit like your arm that, where it's being worn. It, there's no air inside that thing. It is so beautifully packaged. It's really an extraordinary solution. Um, we're doing a lot of robots now that are having an impact. We did the first food service robot for Bear Robotics. We did the, uh, the Walmart Bossa Nova robot. Uh, we did a Stanford Research Institute home service robot. So we are really interested in robotics because that's, that's a new area where we're able to pioneer and many things. One is artificial intelligence by giving machines personalities we're giving them animatronics that make you feel like these things are alive. Um, we're about to introduce the first um, mass-produced dog robot that's really cool. Wait till you see it. It's using the Boston Dynamics uh, platform. Um, and it can be a guard dog. It can be a pet. And it's smart. And it's weird as hell. 
Um, <laughs> Wow. It, it is the uncanine valley. I mean, it's, it is so odd. Um, so we really like having an impact as far as like where new technology is going um, and helping to define that. I'm really fascinated with AI and how we can help mitigate some of the downsides of AI by making AI maybe act and feel a little bit more analog so that we can relate to it better. Um, gosh, we've helped Dell with their whole precision line. It's been on the market for eight years. It just nailed it as far as um, the look and feel and the way it's made. Uh, everybody wants that Dell precision. It's it so just interesting. Reeks like, of precision. Yeah. Um, Everything you guys worked on, it's just, I, I guess it's what I said at the beginning. It's very much those front lines. You guys are just redefining things or reinventing things or just. We, we love, that's a great way to put it. Loba, the front line is where a lot of cool stuff happens. We did the first tiny little computer for a company called Panologic. We did the first computer pen that when you're right with it, it shows up digitized on your phone instantly for LiveScribe. We did all the LiveScribe products. Really, really tour de force of like how you make something like that as beautiful as they are packing all that technology in there. I mean, I, I don't have any gray hair yet, but man, I should after that project. <laughs> there um, are so many questions I could also like ask on how the process would work now with Corona times, but literally no time oh, man, about that. Yeah, <laughs> but, we've adjusted. Uh, I mean, we're, we're figuring that out. We're, we're, it's not stopping us, that's for darn sure. That's good. Um, Although, is it affecting you a lot with China? Are you able to travel there? I'm assuming not. Not able to travel there, but you know, we've perfected how we work with China Inc. as a manufacturing place. And I would say that 85% of products we design are manufactured there. They're just really good at it. Don't believe anything you hear from Americans about China. They're amazing at what they do. They are making very high quality products. Those iPhones we talked about, they're made there. Um, right. Yeah, it's are, designed in uh, California, but made in China. Yeah. <laughs> I love working with these Chinese manufacturers. They're, they're good at what they do. They're super resourceful and they're fast. Um, and we've perfected how we work with them. You know, our files are complete. We kind of design out the mistakes to begin with. So you have to know the path that a manufacturing team will typically take and understand that there might be a liability in your solution unless you design out the mistake before you even give it to them. In other words, don't take risks on certain things that we know they can't do. The particular factory I'm talking about might not be able to do. So you design around their capabilities too. Um, but you know, they're, they're fully operational right now. So, you know, there's been some hiccups, um, but they're yeah, still heard. producing they're doing stuff. really well. Only Beijing got close to, I heard, but they're doing much better than most Europeans and North America and even South America from what I'm seeing. Like they kind of stopped at that 83,000 cases or something and then kind of went up, but then yeah. the rest of the world just exploded. It, uh, no, we don't really, yeah. really know. <laughs> Uh, we don't really know what the facts are, right? So that, that's true. And uh, it might be that's... what we're being told. Um, we, we just don't know. We're all in this big boat of uncertainty together. We um, and I actually think this is a we're, we're trying to see this as a, a the pandemic as an opportunity. Um, I look at um, protection, place, and process as design opportunities. Each one of them has a dynamic opportunity within it. You know, you look at place, just place. Restaurants are gonna have to be redesigned. Gyms, your own home has effect. The way that we are outfitting our homes to be even more web-centric through me methods like this. Um, protection is obvious, you know, preventing people from really getting this disease um, and then process designers need to help with processes think about it. all day long we go through processes in the simplest way i think about it is like just going through a checkout line at a store that process alone that whole process needs to be rethought yeah. to make sure the other p the protection is is offered so the designers already have a they're already pretty good at 
process design because of all the work that we've done in UX, user experience thinking and breaking down a sequence, a journey or procedure that you go through in order to perform a, some type of task. We're already trained in that. So we're poised to offer solutions because of what's happened in this pandemic. So I, I see it as a big opportunity. And it's, it's very much, this is the time where the people that can discover should be discovering, I think. So I, I'm very happy that you guys are doing something with that. Yeah. Um, maybe moving on to the next question then. Um, so obviously we're kind of wrapping up now, but this question is, um, what are you currently doing or learning not related to business that gives you energy? Hmm. Well, I am always in learning mode, first of all. Um, right on the forefront are all the things that I currently have to solve, right? So client problems that I'm dealing with, you know, mostly design problems. The business problems I don't worry about so much. We can always resolve those. So, uh, but we're being faced with a whole bunch of interesting problems right now. These are just active. We have like 50 projects in the office and some of them are just really interesting, cool stuff. This question um, is about not related to business though. So some oh, not related to business. Energy. Yeah. Not related to business. Um, I am always exploring who I am as an artist. Um, I am trying to push myself into new types of artistic expression. Um, and what I mean by that is I'm trying new techniques in painting. Um, I'm also pushing myself musically on my guitar. Um, I'm also doing a lot of introspective work about, about people and myself. Um, I think this is healthy to do anyway, especially during this pandemic. I think it allows you to have a, a moment to self-reflect to make sure you are doing what exactly what you want to be doing should be doing um, to make sure that you are always challenging yourself not to fall back into patterns of behavior which everyone does um, i think it's super important to stay very fresh as a creative thinker so i always seek out inspiration from within and from without, and, and that includes travel, which sadly is not so possible right now. Um, so I do a lot of online stuff. Um, I love architecture, love it. Um, and I like science. I'm always reading about processes and scientific breakthroughs and what, do, what are people, you know, reading this book about how they landed that latest uh, device on Mars, about how that team is, has done this. Um, I'm, I'm reading Creativity Inc. You know, oh, I, I, book. I, uh, I read that three times. It's uh, oh yeah, it's good. It's great. I uh, I literally read that book. Um, what was it? Two years ago when we were struggling, and after I read that book, I think that year we got um our first award so and then within a year and okay, a half we got cool. two awards for our company finally and awesome. uh it's such a good book um and the reason i think uh, we went so deep into the steve jobs thing is because you were talking about him during the phase um of the whole pixar uh thing um and i don't know if you finished the book already i'm but, close uh, yeah the last chapter i i don't think i ever get emotional over books hmm. but uh, that last chapter um it like completely changed how i see steve jobs how i saw apple um it completely put me in a different path it made me comfortable with cr being creative and understanding the unknown um and and understanding where steve kind of was coming from and how Ed kind of um, did Pixar and how he got involved with uh, I'm, I'm telling you that last chapter I don't want to get your hopes up but it is one of the it is it is really up there great right I'm I'm so very inspired by those kinds of stories I like I like these Herculean efforts 
and I, I tried getting Ed um, on the podcast, but we couldn't get through the gatekeepers. <laughs> oh, I, I love these. Uh, when I say Herculean projects, you know, like moonshots and um, oh, the, the book is, is uh, the word about the Mars lander. It's called The Right Kind of Crazy, and it's by Adam Stelzner. And um, he talks about what they went through in the process and the doubt and all the things that we've been talking about applied to how you how you can land that exploration device on on this planet that's so many miles away and what they went through in the thinking and it, they're just they're just people like us too with with the same kind of dreams and doubts and they put it together and they believed in themselves and they actually did it i, I like those kinds of stories i also like uh insights that I otherwise wouldn't have been able to acquire. So I'm reading uh, David Byrne's book, How Music Works, because I'm like, well, okay, I'm more of an artist, but not quite a musician. I kind of, I try to be, but music, I, I love it, appreciate it. I play the guitar, but I'm not great. How does it actually work? What is really going on here? And so again, if, if you're motivated by your own sense of curiosity, it takes you to these kinds of uh, hobbies and and ways of thinking about learning. Have you ever found that if you put yourself, um, so there's two ways of self-reflection I found um, throughout my growth. Uh, one, which I kind of learned from from general knowledge, uh, being you you have quiet, a solitary room, you reflect, you get into flow state by doing things like painting or music or whatever and then thoughts start to roll. Um, another one I recently discovered is about um, getting yourself to a point where you're uh, physically struggling so much that you start kind of um, dealing with the demons that are inside of you and that really helps self-reflection as well. So I guess my question is, you're obviously way further ahead in your career. Um, have you ever done something to physically struggle to the point where you could find a solution to a problem? I don't know if that makes sense to you. The closest that I have gotten to that is, um, here's a really good example. So I'm working on a series of chairs. These are lounge chairs. And I must have sketched at least 200 pages of, of different kinds of lounge chairs. I had some notions, but I felt like, okay, I needed to really get physical with it. So I went into one of our shops and I just hacked away with using wood, foam core, polyurethane foam, stacks of books that could handle my weight when I was trying things out. Um, got very physical. As a matter of fact, design and that way, when you're doing the exploration phase, again, being a maker and a tinker, physicality is good. Mind and body are very much connected. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of studies that the motor cortex and the cerebral cortex, where we do a lot of our creative thinking, they are very linked. There's activity going on in both simultaneously. So the creative act itself is very physical. Even when I paint, I like to get physical. Sometimes I throw paint. Sometimes I use my fingers. Sometimes I'm using... Anything that might be around me could be a stick just to get a certain effect. And when I was designing these chairs, I literally got filthy, dirty, wood dust, glue, made a total mess out of the shop, made a total mess. But I had my breakthrough. You'll see it soon. And that came from being physical, very physical. And yes, there was angst uh, combined with again, that euphoric pull whereby I knew I was getting close. I knew I was onto something, but sometimes it's like a carrot. It's like right there. It's right there. You can sense it and you push your way forward. And then all of a sudden, oh, now I can smell it. And now you can see it. Oh, and then it drifts away a little bit. Eventually you'll get it if you are determined. And a lot of design comes back to this self-determination, the tenacity to focus and keep trying, keep trying. You'll get there. Some of my designers are completely blown away after they work with me in that I almost never leave well enough alone. I'm like, okay, that's fine. But okay, on that one little hinge, 
I want to see 15 variations on how you handle the end of the hinge. And show me why that's better than that one. That level of detail is so critical and to make a, a complete design sing. And I think it really does have to, it's almost like when you sing the blues, man, a good design, you know it because you, that designer, all of that passion that they've poured into that solution is evident in the result. And you can see it. I love it. This lamp that's in front of me right now, I can see the designer's passion. I can, I already know what they went through to develop this crazy thing. It's an extraordinary double ball joint. It's just magically put together. Again, a lot of that came from a physical act. I like that. I like uh, that you, from a creative point of view, really mentioned the physicality part of it. Uh, I'm just exploring it, so it's really interesting. Um, I want to ask the last question. Uh, the last question, which we kind of covered because you were already mentioning some books. But if you look throughout your career, um, were there certain books that really just, you know, snap, snap something into place for you, gave you some insights that you would recommend to the, to the viewers and listeners? Well, one is find, find the kinds of subject matter that you, you really like. And we all have our favorites, you know, like Sometimes I, I reread Moby Dick, for example, and I, I just could not believe how he was constructing sentences like a designer constructs very carefully a design solution. I mean, every friggin' sentence in that book, I was, it, it takes me like days to read one paragraph or, or one chapter because it's so beautifully crafted. That's like the best book I've ever written. Uh, sorry, read. Um, the book that had a lot of influence on me, especially when I was, um, I think I was 18 years old, was The Fountainhead and Rand's book. And I think because the main character, Rourke, he's an architect, he was an individualist. And the antagonist, in the, he was a protagonist, the antagonist in the book was a, believed in collectivism or, um, wisdom of the crowds, uh, wisdom of the masses, um, appealing to everyone. I was more Rourke. I, I related to this guy. I'm like, no, I have this, as we talked about, I had these like personal visions. I kind of knew how it was going to go and I hated convention. What I had to, and I thought in my early career, all I have to do to become successful is to just let out all that individuality and be my Rourke. And I didn't want to be like this other guy, Keating. Um, those were to me like the designers that ended up pleasing everyone and going to corporations and just kind of falling in line and doing a lot of conventional design of which there's too much in the world. If you only adhere to, and this is the lesson that I learned from this, because I think that's important. Everyone can find their own little special book, but to take something away from that book, that's personal. You got to find it. But what I took away, my lesson I think was, it doesn't quite, your career won't unfold the way that you want it to if you're going to be Rourke your whole career. You are going to be alone and maybe you'll get a few interesting jobs, but you know, you have to speak the language. You have to learn how to appeal to your customer. You've got to learn, in the case of a designer, I had to learn how to be a businessman. I had to learn how to talk to an engineer by first becoming one and understanding what they go through to solve a problem. I had to also be ebullient, like the marketing types that, that might have a big vision on how to sell something. That's more collectivist thinking. And falling in line, if you will, all the while keeping the fire alive. The fire was the Rourke in me, you know, is the, I will strategically, like a good game of chess, get a client to go down this individualistic path, but my means of getting there has to be this, um, a, a, a means that everyone understands, use jargon that they all understand, use strategies that make good sense back with reasoning, even though in the back of my mind, I always know 
the big aha moment is going to come from something that maybe my client doesn't completely understand and wouldn't if I tried to explain it to them. Because you have to be in a certain mindset, that Rourke mindset of an individualist to get it. So, I mean, that was a kind of a long answer to how one book kind of made me initially very inspired and then it kind of backfired on me in my early career. And then I finally figured out how to use both sides of really, I guess, both sides of my brain. And then, to, you know, be fascinated by all these learnings. I mean, knowledge is meant to be shared. People don't really read books anymore. So they're getting a lot of knowledge through this medium, YouTube, yeah. through online searches, quick searches, jumping on Wikipedia. You know, um, it's a new way. That's why I think it's important to do this kind of thing. That's why I laud what you're doing, Lova, because that's the whole intent behind what you're doing. You're really a teaching platform. Yeah, yeah. And the so, mission is very much about sharing. And we started with the events about sharing innovation for future generations. So it's it's good that, you know, your generation can do stuff. But what about the next generation? We were going into our fourth year when we were starting this event and we had just broken through some obstacles and started to become stable. And I was kind of seeing all these beginning startups and I just knew how rough it was going to be. And it was like, what about the future generation? And yes. uh, when uh, when the events went really well, we started realizing, but what about the knowledge part? What about, you know, the online part of it? And, and we started looking at our digital community. And so last year when we started doing that, we really, you know, sat down with the team and decided maybe it's not only sharing innovation, but also sharing knowledge. And, uh, and so our digital kind of department of the company was all about the knowledge part. You know what I love about it? If you think back, all stories were told orally from one generation to the next for a very, very, very long time until uh, religious scholars started writing down the stories of Christ and, and other uh, things and stories. And then along comes the printing press to to bring those stories to the masses. But books are nothing more than a documentation of one story or a group's story or a documentation of some historical thing. But what we're, but it was a mechanism for bringing knowledge to the masses and a very effective one. But if you think about it, it's a lot of coding and decoding that happens when you put letters on paper. Yeah. We, are, we have now come full circle with this medium that we're using right here, YouTube and others, we're back to storytelling, but now we have a means of documenting it the way that letters document and words document thought in books. We're now doing it through this medium that is replayable the same way a book is rereadable. And I think this is the medium of the future. And sadly, books are waning. I mean, actually, I can tell you we have a small innovation department and we're working on some stuff uh, internally to kind of look into how can you go to the next level of this? Why is it that we um, don't prefer this over the physical part? Um, and so in, in, we're kind of tinkering. I can't give too much away, but uh, we're kind of tinkering on on new technologies. Obviously, VR, AR are now in our lives. How can you start looking into, you know, f combining the full teaching experience and making it actually an experience that you want to, that you can understand what is happening. Uh, but yeah, obviously, really you're cool. completely right. Um, we are coming full circle. I do think we're not there yet. Um, else, uh, all schools would go on Zoom, <laughs> which I they're doing it's now still, out of necessity. <laughs> yeah, and it can still be clunky. I mean, the user interfaces uh, could be better. It is... Uh, I I think I think once um, I know if you're following the news with Starlink and what SpaceX just launched, I think once Starlink can provide proper internet worldwide, like fast uh, internet, um, I think we're gonna start going into that. Uh, with a lot of the companies, um, we work with some large uh, telcos as well. Where we we were actually. Um, 
talking to them because uh, obviously we we have to do some of the videos that they, that they need and we were already working with them on 5g before it went you know to the public so they were explaining 5g to me and i was just like so it's like 4g 3g but like mm -hmm. 5g but then the applications of 5g there's it's faster than wi-fi so you could literally yeah. do surgery in a surgery room through vr goggles because it's like real life um so we we see these innovations happen before um kind of like you you see these products come through and then you start getting stimulated and you think wow these technologies are coming why are we not mass adopting things and then obviously nobody knew how 5g would be interpreted the way it did now yeah but uh, so sad. But Starlink is going the other way and Starlink could be a potential breakthrough as well. I, I love all this new technology. I just, I embrace what's coming. I used to think that I could eventually maybe help. I think it was an earlier naive way of viewing the future that, that designers can really help make a utopian world uh, however, there's a lot that's working against that. And it's, there's this pull, this dystopic existence that, that sometimes you wake up in the morning, you're like, oh my God, you know, we're going backwards as a civilization and we're not learning anything. But then I always fall back. I'm, I'm amazed at what humans can do. I'm always energized by the latest innovation. And I think we all in our bones feel a sense of optimism when we're born. And it's somehow, um, it's, people get so drawn down into negativity. And I think a lot of it, a lot of leading a good fulfilling life is to, is to remind yourself about that positivity that you were born with and to, when weird stuff happens, like what we're going through right now, know that it's it's all about time, right? This will pass. It will get better. You can probably only go uphill from here. <laughs> and bad things will happen. It's part of what life has, part of what the universe is all about. Um, but do the best you can within it. Thrive however you can. Thrive. You know, and don't be afraid of anything. I think that's a great way to wrap this entire thing up. I am super happy that you were on. I learned so much. Um, thank you so much for coming on. And uh, I hope to see you maybe on the next one as well, because there are so many questions that I still have to ask. You're very welcome. I've really enjoyed this discussion. And um, I hope people, people enjoy it. Um, I'd be happy to do this again, Lova. It was really great, great talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. If you like this episode, you can check out our most recent one here. And if you haven't already, make sure you click here to subscribe and see the next one. But if you're interested in more tips and tricks, then make sure to join our Facebook group where you can find thousands of like-minded people and you get direct access and support to any business question from the entire startup funding event team.